And we're live. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Christine Van Patten. I'm joined by my husband, Kyle. And I'm going to start doing some sort of an intro because we've decided to start posting our Twitch streams on YouTube. And uh, it'll be a nice place to go back and look at the archives or refer people to specific lessons that we go over. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me. Um, today we're going to be working on a color study for one of my older models, Zariah, who recently got a bit of an update. Um, she got this cool new textured base and some just like production uh, concerns fixed up for her. Um, so yeah, so we're going to work on that today. Now, I did a poly painted version of Zariah when I first sculpted her, um, which I think you have on the screen, right? Uh, I do, yes. Um, and this was just like very basic mapped out colors, basically like a base coat of colors that I saw her in. Um, but today we're going to sort of like deep dive into a more complex and rich color scheme based on the same idea, the same concept that I had originally had. Um, so I found this image for inspiration that we're going to be working from of this tiger. Um, and one of the big things that I'm looking for when it comes to a color reference photo is that it's striking the right emotional chord when I look at it. I have the tiger up for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so for Zariah, I want her to be fierce, formidable, quiet. She's contemplative in this moment where she's like thinking about her her prey and what she's tracking here, um, but dangerous. And I really felt like this sort of scattered sunlit tiger really struck that same emotional chord. Okay. So I'm going to start with just laying in like an overall color for her. Which the, the ground will probably stay pretty similar to this. Um, but then we'll start by airbrushing some like general colors like a base coat would be. Um, where's my poly paint button? I know I just mapped it. Aha. First try, look at that. Woohoo! You're going to have to give me a big smile. Also, if you could make ZBrush a little bit uh, less wide. Less wide. I can do that. You always tell me more wide, so I went a little bigger today. There you go. Perfect dimensions. This model is more difficult to paint than some of my newer models. Um, All right, how come? Uh, the pose that I chose here, um, it's just very difficult to get into some of these nooks and crannies and have good brush control. Um, it's really not the ideal pose in terms of painting. I have, this is one of the first digital sculpts that I did and I was still learning quite a bit. I fixed some of the production issues, like I said recently, in terms of like painting, but, uh, or in terms of printing for supports and stuff, but um, 
I think there's there's Im- improvement to be had in terms of ease of painting. And it's something that I try to work into all of my sculpts now. I try to be very focused on a pleasurable experience for the painter. Anticipating what they might want or need out of a model. I'm taking this green from sort of the lower right hand corner of our reference image where it's got this very saturated yellow green or jungle green, I guess you could say. But one of the fun things about reference images is it it already gives you your highlight and shadow colors like all right there. (laughs) It's all very visible. Now you're doing this in ZBrush instead of in uh, physical paint just because it's a lot faster, right? But all these principles would still apply if you were physically painting this model. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm doing it here because uh, it's easier for me. I'm more fluent in this uh, sort of digital painting uh, in terms of poly painting because I've been doing a lot of practice on it in the last couple of years. Um, So it's much faster than just trying to, like, do this all by hand in paint and, like, mix the proper colors. I can just select whichever color I want. This isn't because you can't paint. Like, you've won multiple Sophies, and you were an accomplished watercolor artist before you ever got into this as your former career. So you're familiar with a paintbrush. This is just a (laughs) different medium. Yeah. Yeah. One that I really come to enjoy and I think doesn't really get enough uh, credit in terms of usefulness. Bill the Master Crafter says, good afternoon. Hey, Bill. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to hanging out with you on Sunday. I've got a... a Lord Gasumba is going to have us on Sunday evening for like a hobby chill night where a bunch of creative people are going to get together and just do what we do and hang out and talk. It's going to be super fun. You have a link to, uh, Bill, do you have a link to... What is it that I'm thinking of? Oh, the um, Lord Gazumba's stream. I'm going to have to decide here shortly whether i want her what color i want her um hand wraps and stuff around the weapons and also around her chakras here i think we can repeat this slightly more desaturated, but repeat this same color for the the teeth. Bill says, sorry on my phone, sitting GI. Sitting in traffic. Ah, I gotcha. 
Yeah, please don't get in a wreck in traffic. <laughs> That'd be bad. It's not worth it. It's G O S U M B A. Yeah. Let's see how this would be quite difficult to get to the back of this. And physical paint with a paintbrush. Now I've painted this model badly, but I've painted it. And you can get to that play those places. It's just not as easy as it is on some of your other sculpts. You're cutting in and out. But yes. Yeah, it's doable. It's just more complicated than I would like it to be. Sometimes that's a compromise you have to make, though, right? For the composition or the pose you want to get, or... That's true. Though, I think there's... I've learned to minimize some of the negative parts to that. In terms of, like, construction. When I was looking for reference photos, I also found this really beautiful photo of a, um, I don't know what kind of monkey it was. It was some kind of monkey, but it had this black fur for everything except its face. And then its face gradiated to like a reddish, like a really rich red brown. It was beautiful. But didn't have a whole lot of green in the image, which I knew I wanted to use. And it didn't quite have the same ferocity that I was looking for. Hard to get too much more ferocious, ferocious than a tiger. <laughs> yeah. Bill says uh, he will show off some painted pirates, Hook and Friends. Oh. Oh, nice. Yeah, Bill's been painting up our Neverland Pirates for an upcoming sea campaign on Lord Gasimba's channel. Oh, that's great. I love those pirates. I haven't seen them in quite a while because, you know, they're sort of going on two years old now. But uh, getting ready for ReaperCon, we had to print a bunch out, hoping to sell some. And man, they're just fun. They're fun models. You did a good yeah. job. Thank you. Now, this is one of those instances that I really find like happy moments in terms of painting because if you look at the colors I'm using for the whites of the eye here, I'm basing this off of our reference image for the tiger's eyes. Um, but our eyes, the whites of our eyes are hardly ever actually pure white. Um, and depending on the lighting situation can be quite dark so this is one of those opportunities where I can like use a color that might be unexpected. Okay. Or you might not think, oh, let me paint the eyes like yellow with a greenish shadow. Might not be your go-to, but... No, the mini feed is not loading for me. Somebody just either subscribed or did something because it played the audio, but no visual cue. Uh -oh. So I don't know who just did something. Who just did something? If you did something, say something.
we've been trying really hard to get bots and stuff to work. And we've had no success. It's terrible. The eyes on this tiger, which are, you know, the eyes of any character are going to be very, very important, right? Yeah. Um, but the eyes on this tiger are surrounded by this really thick black line. And I really like that that heavy contrast it has going. I think I'm going to fill in the whole eyelid here with this black to really draw on that tiger energy. You almost never use a straight black. Well, this is like a brown black. Bill says he generally uses light gray or khaki for eyes, I'm assuming, for whites of eyes. Yeah, that's a good go-to. I tend to reach for like a, a gray, like a cool gray. Um, but either way works. Makes sense. Just as long as it's not like pure white. And also that gives you some room to play with highlights because if you're using a pure white for the base of your eyeball then, you, then there's nothing brighter than that to use as a highlight Tiger has like the. Oh, I'm also going to pull up. Um, I had another reference photo of this beautiful woman. Oh, I. And I this didn't is. What you said there. Are you going to go pull up what? Uh, this reference photo I found. Oh, yeah. This beautiful woman. Um, but this is. This I'm going to be using to reference for like how the skin should reflect light okay. and what what colors sort of naturally appear on the skin for women with this complexion, natural coloring. So you can see, I don't know if you can see this actually. Can you see this over my, yeah, you can. Okay. Um, you can see in the, as the eyeball rolls back into, into the face before it comes back out for the brow ridge, you get this more saturated, orange through here uh -huh. um, before it lightens up here on the cheek and we're gonna play with that with some of our tiger colors Know what you guys are thinking? This is crazy. <laughs> I never think that anymore. I used to for years. Every time you painted something, I was like, "Oh, this is not going to be good." It's always the last touch. There's a method to the madness that just brings it all together. I was a, a bit of a trigger warning for uh, graphic description regarding blood and stuff. I uh, I worked as a paramedic for a lot of years, still do part time. I worked in a hospital ER once, out in a little little small town, and a guy came in with a uh, hand that had been sliced up very badly. And this little tiny old 80-year-old ER doctor in this small town hospital decided he was going to suture this back up. Well, that's not a thing you're supposed to normally do in a small town hospital, right? You'd ship them out to a really big hospital. And in, in this town, we were about an hour and a half away from the best hand surgery facility in the world, which is 
uh, Samsi and or Bamsi, depending on what they've d currently decided to name it. And you'd usually just put that guy on an ambulance and send him to a place where the people that hands down do this the best will take care of it. Well, he decided to suture this up and ask me to help. So I'm sitting there holding this guy's hand, just biting my tongue the whole time because that was very new. And watching this guy just absolutely Frankenstein this guy's hands back together. It was looking so bad. I was very, very worried for the guy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm never going to work again. I'm being a part of this. It's already too late. We've started, but oh man. And he finally finished and he made a couple little snips. Uh, Move some dead tissue and stuff. And suddenly it went from looking like a bad Frankenstein job to there was a fine line that was barely visible on one part of this guy's hand. And it was the last two minor things on this hour and a half procedure that changed it from terrifying to amazing. Well, it turns out the guy was the chief hand surgeon at SAMSI for 30 years before he retired. So he was the best hand surgeon in the world that this guy just hand us happened to stumble into this little dinky ER and his malpractice insurance at his age was three times his salary. He just did it because he was bored and didn't care and liked what he did. So he paid the malpractice to keep practicing. And boy, this guy got lucky out of that, right? Because... <laughs> They, they fly people from other countries to get doctors like that to do those kind of procedures. And here's this. Yeah. And I will never forget that as an example of don't speak up with people that know more than you about the topic until you've seen the full procedure. If I had opened my mouth earlier, I would have been an idiot. And I almost did a lot of times. But uh, it, was a, it was a hard lesson learned. I, I had to swallow a lot of ego after that. But I've noticed the same things with your paintings. They look horrifying often before they're finished. And then suddenly it all comes together. So Bryce says, uh, Wapel always says it has to look horrible, and then it looks amazing. And then he said, that's a great story. Uh, Big Apple says, howdy, homies. Hey, Big Apple. Hello, how are you, Big Apple? What you working on today, Bryce? He says, so we can't give you feedback anymore? That's <laughs> different. No, no. <laughs> That's not what I said. Just don't assume you know more was the lesson I learned. I could have asked. And that would have been a better approach. And I think that's true of any time you're dealing with somebody that knows what they're doing, is you should start by assuming they know what they're doing. And if you see a discrepancy between what you think you know and what they think they know, that's a topic for a discussion. And somebody's going to learn something, and you don't know which way that's going to go. But you shouldn't be condescending or arrogant about it. Uh, yeah. Unless they refuse to look at, er at reference photos. And then <laughs> you should absolutely be condescending. Uh, Big Apple says, what is this dope sculpt? This is... She's an older sculpt of mine. But an oldie but a goodie still. This is Zariah, the uh, Zulu Ranger. Which you got a little flack for calling her a Zulu Ranger originally. But... Uh, I really did, like, I did base her off of, like, research I did about right Zulu costuming and, and stuff. So it's like, well, I mean, not really it costuming, wasn't, it wasn't Zulu clothing. Right, like traditional yeah. clothing. Yeah, you did a lot of research, but you didn't just slap that title on there. It's actually a lot of Zulu uh Garb. 
Obviously not the weapons. Those are made up fantasy weapons, but. So you gotta have some of that. Now, as you're coming through here on the face and you're laying this stuff in, tell us a little about what you're doing. Uh, that would probably be helpful, huh? You want to yeah. know? Yeah, we want to know. Okay, so I'm, I'm comparing this um, face study that I, that I got this reference. Um, and I'm trying to notice like where the light is falling on her face and in what intensity you can see where the highest uh, values are right here at the top of the cheekbone here at the the ridge of the head forehead and then here on this side of the nose so i've mimicked that in my my color study here we have that image on our screen so you don't have to load it over oh okay great um, and this is actually like her her highlights are even higher than I've gone here um, and a little bit warmer, but I'm just sort of laying in the the map for it. And then I can always like punch up the contrast. And I'm trying to match this to colors that I'm also seeing in the tiger reference image one of the one of the things we talked about in the last uh, color study we did and we'll probably end up talking about more today is finding those little magic colors and this is I think one of the really really difficult parts about um, about learning to really up your color game is developing the awareness and eye for these really subtle hues. Um, this is not an easy task. And it took me actually years into my art school degree before it really like clicked for me. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm going to try and point out a specific one that I've noticed. Um, right up here in this patch of black fur on the tiger's back. I remember we can't, can oh, we can see your mouse when you drag. We can see it. Right here. <laughs> mm. um, the light is hitting this this patch of black fur and as it's transitioning into the surrounding fur, it's getting this almost purpley Can you red. Zoom in really far on the area you're talking about, because we just see a picture of a tiger. Like right here. I don't know. Can you see that? Do you know what I'm this talking about? This is what we now? see. We don't know. Okay, like right <laughs> that patch, that big the... diamond-shaped patch there. There's like this purple oh. shift that's happening around between, the black between the black and the surrounding fur as the light is touching it um, oh yeah I do see purple okay so it's got this really pretty purple almost like a purpley red uh, and it's those little subtle colors which if we start popping that in here like and we can we can like Amplify that a little bit, right? Um, actually, I'll I'll give you a really good example of how we could use that. So I'm gonna lay in her hair color, which is gonna be, I think, darker overall than the first time I did this. But because I've laid down this this rusty color all over the model. And this would work in, in real paint as well. Um, I, I'm not being too specific about co covering everything super thoroughly because I'm leaving some of that uh, rusty that color brown, brown mm -hmm. 
to sort of sort of add some dimension to the hair. And this would work if you were airbrushing in, in real life as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Bryce says he would like a discussion on how you choose the colors from the magic color box. There are millions of colors, and you just quickly click somewhere, and that is the color. Yes, uh, I can talk about that for sure. Um, so... In order to explain that, let's talk about the anatomy of color. Um, color can be broken down into hue, which is basically what family of color it falls into. This is typically broken down by your, by your rainbow colors, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, and within the, each of these hue families, is a spectrum of colors. Uh-huh. Uh, I gotta figure out how my... How did Kirk do that? Where he like... I don't know. Here, Kirk, come on over here for a second. Mommy needs you to show her how to do something in ZBrush. Come here. <laughs> come here. How do you make this color box go big? How do you pick a color, Kirk? What do you do? Oh, I see. You got to click the little box. Okay. Thank you. Give me kisses. <laughs> <laughs> we let our son poly paint models sometimes when Christy's not using her computer. That's one of his fun things to do. And we look over one day and he's got this big color selection box open and we had no idea how he managed to get that to happen. He's six, but... <laughs> I was like, what? How did you do that? How does he make it big like that? Um, okay, so I've, I've kind of colored her hair. What was I talking about? Oh, the anatomy of color. Um, so you have your hues, right? Which, yellow, green, blue, blue-green, um, which is typically broken out down into a total of for 12 colors. There's usually 12 colors in the color wheel uh, that serve as a basis for a hue family. Makes sense. Um, convenient organization, like a clock. Now, Aside from the hue itself, like say I wanted to find that that purpley reddish color, right? Uh -huh. That's what I was looking for. So I come here to my my reds and shift it down closer to the the purple side, so like in this pink area here. And then I come down in in value right because it's not a very bright color and it's certainly not a very light color so it's going to be down here in this bottom uh quarter and then i have to figure out how much gray versus how much color is in it so that's that's saturation how much gray is in it versus how much color is in it and then i can determine sort of where in this spectrum that color falls. So it seems really difficult until you sort of understand the, the roadmap or how it's broken down. And then it becomes pretty easy to figure out. And then you can see the little swatch that comes up in the preview image. And you can go, oh, that's a little too purple. I can slide it up and make it more red. Oh, it needs to be pinker. I can slide it down and make it more purple. As long as I've got about the the right value range here, I can shift the color. Does that make sense, Bryce? Okay, so I've laid in like her general the general map of her hair here. 
And I'm going to come in with that little magic purple color. And put it over here where there's going to be more light, where I'm intending there to be more light. And you can see how it's a subtle shift in color. It's not like it's not like I'm laying in a crazy vibrant color, but it's just enough to sort of vibrate differently with the colors around it. And I don't know how to describe it better than that. I've tried before and it doesn't I can't find a better word for that. But I call them these magic colors because they're these little transition colors that really just make everything else so much sweeter. The little hints. So where most people, when they're talking about a model and they're blending, they're just going from the orange that they're using to the green that they're using. I like it. And uh -huh. it's just an orange to green gradient. You're finding colors to insert in between them purely as part of that gradient. But never enough right, to so actually like, be that color. Yeah, and I like to exaggerate this. So like... Oh, well, that's kind of your defining As an grade. example. If... I could use this color, which is pretty much what, what I was pointing out in the reference image, this very dark and desaturated purple. It's a little more vibrant than what's in the image. But I could go more. I could take this and ramp up the, the saturation, come up a little bit more in value so it's a little bit brighter. Then I can lay that in and really start to push this tone into the, the light parts of the hair. Now here, you are doing a caricature of color, for lack of a better term. That's a really good description, yeah. It's, it's essentially like stylizing color. Because this color exists in your reference image. Just never enough for yeah. your eye to really heavily pick out. You don't look at the tiger and think it has purple. It's present. Right. I'm just exaggerating and it. So you're taking those little colors that are barely there and saying, hey, look at this color you didn't know was there, which still looks right when you look at it for weird reasons because your brain knows that it's there on some weird subconscious level that the rest of us don't think about. But... When it shows up, then we get to see that. So are you going to be coming in and putting another color in this hair also? Um, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. So I, I have a, generally when I start out, I have a general plan of what I want to do. But what the really fun part about it for me is, is the, the discovery of it. Like really... Oh, wow, look at that color. I didn't know that was in there. Oh, let's use some of that. We got to put it here. We got to put it here. And then you just go That's crazy the fun with it. Part. And then it's everywhere. <laughs> and then it's everywhere, yeah. Obviously, studying um, life studies, uh, Knowing how light falls on different surfaces, that's all going to be super useful. So there's not a magic wand, hey, this is, how, this is the color, right? It's, this is about practice, like anything else. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no quick fix for almost anything in life. But there are ways to condense how much time you're expending to develop that skill. Yeah, you can certainly speed up some of that process if you have someone who has already been through it and can help you in the discovery parts. Which is what we're trying to do here, right? 
Yeah. Um, now, your big discovery moment you talk about is the egg, the egg painting or sketch with colored pencil sketch. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. It's a great exercise for people. Yeah. So my drawing, I don't remember. She taught my drawing two and my drawing three. I don't remember which class this was in, but um, she's a fantastic artist. And she was trying to help us develop what I was talking about, which was the, the eye for finding these these little magic colors. Um, and her exercise that she gave, her homework that she gave to help us develop this skill was she gave us each an egg, just like a white egg, and she sent us to different corners of the room and she said that we had to draw the egg using colored pencils only, no, uh, no black and white, and no line drawing. You couldn't, you couldn't just like draw the outline of it. It had to be a fully rendered piece. And I must have stared at that egg for half of the class period, like. How am I supposed to do this? <laughs> I don't understand. It's white, and this is a white background and a white egg, and how am I supposed to do this with colored pencils? And I don't know if you've ever done those, like, those magic eye things. Magic eye things. Yeah, they're like uh, the, like, images where it's just, like, this random collection of colors and like if you stare at it long enough and you let your eyes sort of haze over you see an image okay you never done yeah, those yeah i remember those okay they're like hidden image things yeah um so i got to that point where i just stared at it for so long that i lost sort of sense of what the object was and I just saw the colors and I started to realize there were blues and greens and turquoises and um, purples, like all these colors that were from the light bouncing around the room and hitting this egg. And there was like this fuchsia and I was just like, it was like I had gone to Disneyland. I was so excited to have found all of these colors and I sketched this whole egg in colored pencil and there wasn't a single outline or or black or you know white anywhere to be found it was just this array of rainbow colors that actually looked like a white egg when I was finished. And I was like, I'm so sold. This is what I want to do forever. <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, and so, yeah, that became a, a really big part of my, my work and my, um, my sort of focus in terms of art for, for the next forever, I guess. I don't think it's ever stopped. And it's actually one of those things that like I couldn't I can't think of a better way to help people develop that skill than that exercise because it was so useful. But also I don't know how useful it would have been if I was not on my second and third level of art school at that point. Um, if I would have found that useful at all or even been able to accomplish it had I not already been pretty far along in my my art journey. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's something that people would find useful or not. It's interesting. I certainly did. I think you could accomplish a similar goal by... Uh, gritting off a digital picture 
right? So if you were to do the tiger here in, in like high school art classes, you draw a grid over the tiger and then you draw a grid on your paper and you map out each individual square of the grid, almost like you were doing a mural for an installation, right? You do your concept for the mural, you grid it out, then you grid it out on the wall and you paint all the individual squares. Uh, you can do the same thing on a piece of paper. So if you took like this tiger and you gridded it off and then you zoomed in on your screen to each individual square and then took colored pencils to color in what you saw in that square. Now the, the final piece wouldn't be great, right? Because it'd be very disjointed. You're going to guess a different height on this box than on the other one next to it or whatever else, but it'll end up looking a little almost pixelated, for lack of a better term. But you would, uh, you would be able to find the colors that you might not otherwise find. If you force yourself to spend enough time on each box to really search for the colors, like looking for the purple in that gradient between the black and the orange on the tiger. I see it now really easily. I'm assuming everybody else does. If you look at that spot right between the tiger's ears on its back over the top of its head, uh, it's a black spot, but there's a purple. The top third of that black spot is purple. You would never think that if you don't practice. So for those of you that are just joining, I'll try to zoom in a little on that now, it, now that I know what she was talking about. <laughs> Make the tiger bigger. See what we can do here. So this spot right in the middle of the screen in fact, most of these black spots are at least a third purple when you zoom way in. And then this orange above that black spot is a lot of yellow. You're proud of me that I see the yellow. You're like, no, that's obvious. <laughs> Not proud of me that's at all. A, that's a highlight. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think you could consider this one of them. Um, but there's blue around the eye. I see the blue here. Yeah, this blue white is really pretty. This gray right above the the pink of the nose. There's like this blue gray. And then on the shadow side of his nose is this green that's yeah, kind man. of like a like a yellow mossy green. And I think that's going to be important. Okay, wait. So I'm looking at this nose. And he's got the pink nose. And right over yeah. that, we've got mostly blue with a little bit of yeah, purple that, over on the right-hand side of the blue. That little blue patch. Yeah. Oh. And then I on the right side, it's all green. It's like a mossy sort of yellow green. I see the greens. I see the yellows and the greens. Why is there so much green in that tiger's face. How, where's that coming from? Why is there green? Uh, one, because he's surrounded by forest, so the light is bouncing off of the green leaves and it's, it's hitting him. It's bouncing back on him. Um, and two, because there's a lot of yellow in his fur, so the, the shadow mixed with the yellow is going to give you like a greenish okay. hue. Now, uh, Epic Adventures says uh, that's how Chuck Close paints. Are you familiar with Chuck Close? Chuck Close. That name sounds really familiar. Says he was a Where photorealist painter that was known for his hyper-realistic portraits. Uh, funny thing is he had a condition that did not allow him to recognize people by their faces. Oh, interesting. Uh, Valandar says Chuck Blue Close. Sky makes faintly greenish tinge uh, due to indirect lighting. Valandar says afternoon. Good afternoon, Valandar. Great to have you here, as always. Uh, 
So, Bryce, is any of the, are you finding any of this um, helpful or useful? I know we were talking about sort of the breakdown of the the color grid. Did that help in terms of like knowing why I'm picking the colors that I was picking? Or zooming in on the picture, breaking it down. I think that's the big one for me is uh, not looking at what I expect to see, but what is actually there. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. It's hard. Like the green in the nose. If you hadn't said there was green in the nose, I don't think I would have seen it. But even you struggle with that sometimes, right? Like we have Ticknack that we painted up. And Ticknack had a lot of yellow highlights. And when you use the Ra Reaper paint picker, it kept coming up with blues for the highlights on Ticknack, which didn't yeah. make any sense at all because it's a green model with yellow highlights. So where's the blue coming from? But it was highlighting with blue. Uh, kept saying, use blue. So when I painted it, I used the color that Christy found with the power palette, and it looked fantastic. I mean, for me. I wouldn't say it actually looked fantastic, but it looked tolerable. Uh, when we touched that up, and you just went in and, well, let's just see what it looks like with yellow highlights. And it flattened the whole thing. It took all the richness out of the color. When we went over the the blues with the yellow and yellow green, which I just found fascinating because it should have been right. By all accounts, by light physics and everything, it should have just been correct. But you were more right in your original. When you told us what colors to use, you were correct. <laughs> we should have listened. Yeah. Uh, Bryce said, yes, this is cool. I need to try it now. Uh, Epic Adventure Miniatures says, Chuck Close said he had prosopagia, face blindness, and suggested that this, that this condition is what first inspired him to do portraits. Huh. Uh, Bryce wants to know, what are the two colors below the selector? So this is basically just like what's loaded in my brush for lack of a better word. And then uh, the one on the right is the one that I'm actively using. And then I can like switch it to like a backup brush. Um, so I can like hold this secondary color and I can just hit this switch really quickly if I wanted to. Um, I don't really use the switch function very much. It just, it's just there. A useful thing potentially though, when you're, when you've got one color you keep placing. It would be a good thought to store it. Yeah. Uh, Valendar says burgundy and orange-brown. <laughs> uh, it would be very akin to like a, in a traditional sense, two-brush blending uh, where you you sort of keep a secondary brush load it up with a color that you want to be using frequently and then switch back and forth between the two to blend it. Um, that would be like a practical use for it. Uh, Valendar said like a foreground background in Photoshop and right, yeah, yeah. an Epic Adventures miniature says much like in Photoshop it can be handy if you are using contrast colors. Right, yeah. Now, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think, uh, okay, so do you see this color right down? Ah! No, right down here on the the his front left leg as it goes back in space. 
Okay, so the receding leg is the one we're looking the at The receding, here. right. All right. Um, this, like, really rich red-brown. It's, like, a very, very rich orange. I see very orange. Red, yeah. Um, so there's red there. I'm trying to see the red. Working on it. <laughs> I don't see it yet. Let me zoom in closer. Maybe that'll help me. I'll get I'll get ours and zoom in. I'll show you like it's it's about right here in the in the color picker. So it is definitely on the orange side of but it is the red, red spectrum. Okay. But it is red and it's very saturated oh. and pretty dark. So it's about there. So um, right, and I think I'm gonna use that. Spot. Like right right to the right of the black spot right there. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah black spot to the right of it it's almost the shadow of a black spot and it's a very dark red yeah um, right yeah, yeah yeah see i just would have thought that was a darker orange but it's not you're right it's more red uh so i think i'm really good i like that color especially be, like where it exists in the piece in the lower shadowy quadrant there um, and I think I want to use that for my, the basis for my boot colors for this leather. Now, let me ask you a question. When you're looking for these colors, are you just looking for something that feels right and then you study it to see what color's actually there? Or do you just see those colors now? Because I think the only way I could manage that would be like, okay, that's a cool shadow. It looks right. It feels kind of like the shadow I want. What's actually there? And then blow that way up and look to see what's a breakdown of that and try to be more honest with myself about what I'm seeing. Uh, I mean, I don't really... I, that's a hard question. It's a good question. Um, because I don't, I don't just like automatically know every color that's in there. Like I said, I, I really enjoy some of that discovery process. That's a really fun part of the process for me. But I know as I sort of get to know the image, I'm constantly assessing and finding colors throughout the image. And I'm sort of mentally cataloging where I might want to use that or how I might use that at a later point. Um, and so the more time that I spend with the image, the more of those colors I've sort of built up in my catalog and then when I'm like I need a color for boots ooh let me go grab that color I found that was in the shadow of the leg I see you know what I mean yeah so you saw that earlier and then when you were looking for a good yeah. color for the boots you're like oh I'm gonna steal that that's the color I'm gonna use now there's also some really red browns yeah. in the dirt are you gonna incorporate that into the boots also uh, well I don't know, because I really want to keep some separation. I really, I love this sunlit, dappled. Uh, red clay looking dirt. The red clay dirt. I, I really like that. Um, and I I would like to capture that, but it's, it's really proving challenging. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> also, um, just like for for thinking about where to look for some of these colors, which you might find useful, is that oftentimes I will find them in transitions between the highest part of the highlight and the local color, like whatever color it naturally is. Like if you have a green leaf and the sun is hitting it directly on one side, there's going to be like a really high highlight and then there's going to be a series of transition colors between that highlight and the green of the leaf. Okay. And that's usually where you find those really cool magic colors where it's like, oh, there's like this lime color. Oh, this like hot yellow, you know? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. If I look at the leaf, let me let me see if I can get this. I look at the leaves at the top of the line with Zap zooming in, without zooming in. Now, because we've already looked at leaves in the last color study we did, that's helping me immediately. Because I'm seeing this first uh -huh. leaf is more teal than green. The brightest leaf is far more of a teal 
color right, yeah, than yeah. a green leaf. Yeah. And then there's a little bit of orange on the tip of it and on the right-hand side of that. And then some actual green, some really deep green on the left side of that leaf. Did I about capture it all? Did I find it all for that first one? Did I miss anything? And you said like the yellow, like the yellow olive there. No, where's the yellow olive on the on the front leaf? Oh, are we just talking about the just front, the front leaf? leaf? Yeah, I was just breaking down one leaf. Oh. Don't, don't try to saturate with me with all the leaves yet. I ain't that good. <laughs> oh. Well, there's actually like a magenta. What? Right there. Right there on the the edge. It's kind of hard to see when you zoom in because the pixels make it. I like, didn't zoom in on purpose. So I just looked. But back. on the oh. right, from our perspective, the right side of the leaf has like a line that delineates it. That's that gets that hot pink. Yeah. It's dull, but it's but like it's, it's a hot pinkish color. Yeah, I never would have saw that. At least not with, uh, without zooming in. Maybe if I had zoomed in, I would have seen it. Let's see. I don't, I don't think I would have. So here's that image. Here's the leaf. And if we zoom in way in. Yeah, there's just a hint of it. Just barely see yeah. that magenta. I never would have seen that. And even if you, like Bryce was saying, he goes all the way until he sees pixels. But even if you went all the way to pixels on this, you probably wouldn't see that magenta. So No, that's one of those things that's like there's more of a sense of it than there is a swatch of it. Yeah. Because you're seeing multiple pixels and how they're blending together, which is creating that magenta. Yeah, your eyes are blending it. Like pointillism. Your eyes are, are blending it for you. Now you can see more of the magenta at the center of the little tiny leaf immediately to the right of that one that we were just looking at, the one that's going behind yeah. it. Yeah. You can see more of that there. It's interesting. This is hard. <laughs> see if I can't get that back where it goes. Okay. Let's catch up on chat. Uh oh. But you, but you are starting to see it, right? Some of it, yeah. Okay. That was weird. Twitch told me access denied for a second there. Let's see. Islander said, the shadow seems teal. The highlight of the other leaves look like a bright green yellow. That front leaf, we're only seeing the underside. And then he said, oh, no, wait, we aren't. That edge of the leaf is where we're losing the chlorophyll and chloroplast like a leaf about to fall in autumn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like sort of dead there. And Bryce said, I wouldn't have looked to magenta there even to see it. You know. Even, even to what? Even, you even cut out. He said he wouldn't have looked there even to see it. Oh, now, I see. My thought there is it might serve people like me better and in the short term until he got better at it, which would take him like a week, and it would take me years. But for Bryce, uh, perhaps if we made a point of looking for each color, because something you said to me probably four or five years ago is that there isn't anything that doesn't have the whole spectrum of colors in it somewhere. That it's all there. Just a question yeah. of how much and where. So if you make a point to say, I will find red, blue, yellow, orange, magenta, on this part of this image somewhere, where can I find it? it might help us better. Because like when you said, well, there's a lot of green there on the tiger, I didn't see it until I was looking for green. So maybe purposefully see. trying to find each color individually might help that process. Yeah, I could see that being helpful. Or maybe not. 
maybe it will be a utter fail, but shortcuts. Now, see, okay, so here's where we're going to get a little bit creative. In the reference image for the woman, you can see how her lips become like a very vibrant watermelony color. Yeah. Like a coral, like a warm pink. Yeah. Um, which doesn't really exist in our tiger image in any like standout-ish way. Um, so trying to think what I want to replace that with. And I'm faced with, I think, two choices. One, I either draw from the natural pinks of the tiger in the nose and maybe exaggerate it a little bit, take some of these colors here in the nose, which are certainly less vibrant and watermelony than her lips were. But I could amp up the the saturation of it a bit and still maintain some harmony within the colors. Mm -hmm. Or I try to capture the vibrancy more importantly and draw from these red browns that show up right here in the forehead. Now there's a little bit um, in his ear there, right? So some pink of some kind. Yeah, this is like the in, inner ear is very purple, but right here on the edge there gets to be sort of like. But it's still that like faint pink. pinkish purple. But yeah, it's still a pretty faint pink. So I don't know these are the moments where you have sort of choices to make. Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to stick with the color? Is the color itself, the hue, more important? Or is the vibrancy more important, the saturation of it? Um, and you just have to make that judgment call. For this character, she's not especially glamorous. She's not done up. She's not, like, wearing makeup. Um, and she's in a very naturalistic setting. So I think I'm going to prioritize the, the pinkness. And just play play down the the vibrancy part. Now this is interesting because I would have anticipated for you to just pull the pink out of the other image, but that'd be incorrect. That would it would not be harmonious with the rest of the colors in this picture. It would stand out as not the same. So. As much as it's valuable to know how to pick a, the right color, not picking the wrong one might even be more <laughs> important. Yeah. And that's where sticking to your reference image, making sure it's a color that's present there somewhere at least, even if it's buried down in the tuft of a eyebrow. Stick with colors you can find in the image. Yeah. Now, you played with the whole pixelation thing after advising people to check that out as a beginner-level way to find colors. Uh, I did. I put, I put the images in Photoshop and then um, pixelated it using the, the filter, the pixelate fi filter. Um, I was not pleased with the results of that. I found that it it kind of, uh, what's it, like coagulated the colors? I don't know a better word for that. Oh, but like, God. yeah, like it it found the median of those colors instead of like pixelating the existing colors. Yeah. That was not what I was looking for. Um, and I did not find that especially useful. Now, her upper lip in the reference image is actually really close to her skin tone, which is interesting. I'm going to layer some of that skin tone over the upper lip and then keep the pink 
in the lower lip. And I think we can go a little more vibrant than we did, but just a touch. Now, if you were doing uh, acrylics here, you would be layering each of these, right? Just, okay, we're going to start with a yeah. layer it up to a safish color. Okay, I want it more vibrant than that. Layer it up a little more. Uh, I yeah. also noticed you haven't put your highlights in the eyes yet. Are you going to go back for that? Yeah. Why I haven't done it yet is um is a good question, but I don't have a good answer. Okay. I just haven't. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I think you were working on the eyes and weren't finished with them, and we pulled you into a discussion about the hair. Well, you moved to the hair as an example of what Bryce was asking, I think. Really. I thought it was... I, so I was watching... Um, Sam does art on YouTube the other day, and he was he was doing a master's color study of a girl with a pearl earring by... Oh, God, what's his name? Yo, Johan Van Eyck. Yeah. Jan Van Eyck? John Van Eyck? What's his first know. name? Uh, by Van Eyck. <laughs> there you go. Um, and he was like, oh my gosh, there's like blues in the skin and greens in the skin. I can't believe all the colors I'm seeing in this skin. This is masterful the way he's done this. And I was just like <laughs> kind of laughing like, yeah, man, you, you didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> there's There's more than... Than just skin color in the skin, uh, but I remember that that discovery moment myself. So like, it's just it's really fun to see other people get their own little discovery moment. His stream is actually really fun to watch. If you haven't checked it out, yeah, it is. It's uh, what is it called again? Sam does art. Yes, good work. It's amazing what a difference slapping some white onto the eyeballs does, right? It's just crazy. Yeah. Now, your reference has a little bit of that same thing to the bottom lip. Are you going to do the same thing here? The white highlights. Oh, so yeah, I mean, I could, I could do that. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was in your plan. I was looking at this uh, tiger, and then his nose is not very highlighted. It is a little bit, but. But that was your plan with her, right? You wanted to see how and where the light fell on her and reflected. Because fur doesn't reflect yeah. the same as skin. Right. Making sure I'm understanding properly. I'm not dictating, to be clear. No, no, you're 100% right. I'm just trying to follow along. But she has very little reflection in her top lip, huh? Much more pronounced in the yeah. lower lip. Even though you'd think it would. I think we have to bring back some of this orange. This is just not quite reading, right? Yeah, too much white. Yeah. I think you're I think you're falling prey to what I would fall prey to because the reference image doesn't have any highlight at all over the divot in the top of her upper lip. It's only over on that left side of her mouth. Yeah. It should be. But this goes back to using reference images, right? Yeah. References. Heard of them? <laughs>
We can see how she still maintains her sort of naturalness. She doesn't look like she's wearing makeup. I think she <laughs> might have gone slightly too high on the highlights underneath her nose as well for the, for the skin between her nose and her lips. For whatever reason, it draws my eye. But that could also be ZBrush's lighting, so that's hard to say. It's a downside to poly painting in a program that also has, its, has own its own light lighting. source. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, any room that you're painting in is also going to have lighting, so that's you have true. to learn to anticipate that. Yeah, if you're painting a. Uh, if you're painting a model and you're painting it under really high UV light. You know, your your desk lighting and the magnifier lighting and the eight different lights that you have around the room because you just want to be able to see what you're doing. That model's going to look very different on a table in a convention hall when it's only lit yeah. by room lighting. So we're grabbing some of that turquoise that you that you were spotting in the upper leaf there. Which actually, you know what, I'm not gonna do that here. It's a really pretty color, which is why I wanted to put it in the front. But it's the reason we're getting it there instead of on the leaves on the ground is because the, it's not in direct light. It's sort of the, the shadow side, the cool side. Um, so it would better be used in the shadows on the opposite side from our main okay. light source. And a little more sparingly, unfortunately. Bryce says, he's highlighted his message and he says, she is humoring you. Nice job finding turquoise. <laughs> Yes, yes, she did. Now, I was bad. I did not find a reference for the clothing in terms of like the fabric. Which you don't really have to have like the exact same lighting as as the rest of your image is going to be, because that's kind of unrealistic and would take forever. But it is helpful to have some sort of uh, light reference for how it interplays on the material you're trying to render. Mm. Um, so if I knew that her her outfit is going to be, you know, wool or whatever. Well, that's going to reflect light way differently than silk would reflect light. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So being able to accurately render what type of fabric someone is wearing is, is useful. Goes back to, again, references. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bryce says, she's humoring you, your nice job finding turquoise. Don't believe it. Yeah. Totally. You see what I get? I try to give you a compliment. <laughs> there is no unwarranted complimenting in the Van Patten house, in all seriousness. We just don't do it. Yeah, whatever. Good. Good job. I Either guess. you deserved it or I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a both way street, right? I don't tell you I like yep. something. If it ain't good, you're going to hear it. Yep. Very true. Very true. Pleasantries are the enemy of progress. We talked about uh, giving good feedback. The historic, if you've ever taken any type of creative class or you know college courses or whatever, 
one of the things they teach you is how to give feedback, and they talk about the compliment sandwich, uh, which is, you know, two pieces of bread, which is supposed to be something positive you're finding, and then meat in the middle of it, which is the sandwich. And we've talked about this on the stream once before. But the reality is, if you're trying to make a good sandwich, you're not just disguising rancid meat with two pieces of tasty bread. The entire sandwich as a whole should be better and related, and the flavors should intermingle. And giving good feedback is almost an art form because it should entail things that they're doing properly, that they are obviously working on and developing as a skill set, as well as the meat of it. The heart of the sandwich is what you could do to take it to another level with that. So you can talk about, hey, yeah, you did this really well, and you did this really well. And with, if you take those and add in this new thing here, that would, that would tie into where you're go, what you're trying to do here. And then you could, you, you're already doing this, and you can close it with that. And you're just adding another layer to the meal they're already preparing. You're not replacing... Uh, cheese with salami, right? You're maybe you're adding salami or something, but it's a really abstract point. But we'll try to look for opportunities to discuss good. No, I think I think Bryce. Uh, I actually I learned something about this uh, last ReaperCon that I had the pleasure of sitting next to Bryce, uh, which was he would begin by asking the person. So what's your favorite part of this model? Or something similar. Like what was what were you really hoping to to achieve out of this one? And people had various answers and sometimes they were predictable and sometimes they really weren't. Um but then he was able to like construct his criticism in a way that really benefited what they were after and what they wanted to pursue in their, like where they're at in that their painting journey. If I'm trying to do... Uh, I found that really inspiring yeah. as a way to give critique. If I'm trying to do comic book style, don't talk to me about wet blending. Yeah, right. Yeah. That makes sense. Or, you know, if I'm really focused on learning non-metallic metals but you were going to spend your whole time critiquing, you know, the hair. Well, that wasn't really the, that wasn't the purpose right. of my model. That wasn't what I was trying to practice here. So like, it's kind of useless critique for, to hear because that's not really what you were working on. So I found that it was more useful for the end person and also just more right. useful for the critique giver to be able to direct a little better yeah. I can see the difference in the stitching on this model compared to your modern stitching. Yeah. This is very basic compared to what you normally would have sculpted for this. Yeah, it's, it's not that good. It's is it breaking good. your soul a little? A little bit, yeah. Not good, guys. I mean, this model better, was your I'm, fourth I'm digital sculpt ever. <laughs> I'm better than this, I promise. She was your fourth digital sculpt. And you've done... You're closing on four digits of minis at this point. You have sculpted what? so no many way. things. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah, it's been a lot. More than I thought. And... So there's a lot of... Progress. Trash says, I am here for entertainment. I unfollowed just because of the stitching. Kicks the door open on the way out. Because <laughs> of what? The stitching. <laughs> uh, the stitching. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another example of how I'm kind of finding one of these magic colors that that might be a little more difficult to to pinpoint. I love you, Chash. You always bring such a wonderful. <laughs> levity to the stream. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so right here, 
under the chin, like above where the the legs are attaching to the chest in this okay. tuft of fur here under the chin. The whole thing, kind of if you if you like squint and like haze it out a little bit, the whole thing is kind of this green, like a like a yellow green. I've I've pinpointed about where I where I think I want it to be, which is slightly more exaggerated than I think it is in the image. But this is this color that I'm seeing that I really like. Do you see that? Do you see where this is? So it is yellow. It's like firmly in the yellow family. Um, but because there's so much black or gray involved in it, it's toning down the yellow to a green. And I want to put that. Bryce says, yep, I see green. Shake's head no. All right, so let's. You really not see it? Let's see if we can pull it up. I was I was just nodding my head and smiling too. So we're gonna pull this up and zoom this up, and you're gonna look at my screen. Oh, I do see green. I see green right next to the black stripe of his left leg. So on our right side, there's a okay, white yeah, line but of I'm green sorry, there. A little bit, a little bit up. And to, yeah, right yeah, there. Like right in that I whole that area. There, that whole and then I start looking for that same green. I see little patches of that green all over his chest. And the same thing along yeah, it's like, the bottom of his chin. It's kind of like that whole general area. And it's not like a specific instance that's easy to point out. I guess you found that right next to the stripe, which is a little easier to see. But like, I'm... I was just getting a general impression of that area as a whole, sort of reading as a, a yellowy green. Well, I used my trick that I was saying might work before, where I looked for one color transitioning to another color and looked for what color was between them in reality. So okay. there was the orange and there was the black. And right between the orange and black, lo and behold, there's the green you're talking about. And once my eye picked up the green there, like you said, the epiphany moment, suddenly there's green all over the chest of the tiger. Yeah, you can see it all over. Uh, Bryce says, trash makes me happy. And he says, okay, that's better. I think that helped him too. Okay. Yeah. I'm really glad to have you here because, because I, I feel like... Uh, I can sort of test my explanations <laughs> on someone who hasn't already figured it out or seen it yet. Yeah. Uh, Trash wanted to know, Bryce, let me ask you, silicone palettes, have you ever used one? And Bryce says, I can truthfully say no to that one. Have you used a silicone what palette, Christy? I've never even heard of a silicone palette. What is that? It's an interesting idea because it wouldn't be very absorbent. Right, yeah. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trash says, Kyle, do your tiger impersonation. I don't know if I have a tiger impersonation. Christy, do a tiger impersonation. They're great! <laughs> And see here, I was expecting like a Ferrari. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. People can see your tiger ears. Move that so picture pretty. a little bit. Your pink tiger ears. <laughs> Bryce says, he bets they would be easy to clean. And yeah. Bryce says, CVP wins most clever. Yeah, that was clever. <laughs> I really don't know what color I want to make this waistband of hers. I think I originally, what did I do originally? Can you pull up my... My first one. I think I made it like alternating beadwork uh, yes, kind yeah. of thing. 
Yes, I can. Let's see. I uh, don't remember. Where is it at? There it is. Move you up. Boom. Can you see it? Um, what are we looking at now? The color on what? The waistband, like it's gold. The part that oh, I made it gold. Okay. You also right. highlighted her chest piece in gold, which was interesting. Okay. Well, rather outlined it and did the leather highlights, the wrinkle highlights. All right. So let's bring in some of these these high points of the right here on the. <laughs> On the top of the tiger head, that was towards that the was, left side. Bryce said those red oranges up there were his favorite color on the tiger. All right, well let's use some of them. I like this really sunbursty, starbursty orange here. I think that's a really pretty color. So on, I was gonna wait and see if uh, if Anne rated us after her stream, which I guess she didn't. But on Anne's stream today on the Reaper channel, she was talking about uh, different motivations that painters have for for participating in the hobby, and I found this a very interesting topic. She had identified. Um, a number of sort of archetypes that people tended to fall into that she's observed through her p personal coaching, um, through her Patreon, which if you don't know, Painting Big with Ann Forrester, she is an absolute master of color and uh, and a wealth of encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to paint composition um, yeah there's a there are a lot of folks that know about color but Anne's unique knowledge of uh i mean and Anne knows a lot she knows as much as anybody else about color she's definitely top tier on that stuff but her additional knowledge of also knowing about what chemicals what compounds are going into paints to make different pigments and how they interact with each other i mean it's what she did forever in a day but it's a uh, uh it really makes it a, a valuable her a valuable resource for learning uh, specifically painting techniques. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so she teaches. She has like a private coaching tier of her Patreon, Painting Big, and uh, she's identified some of these archetypes that people tend to fall into for why they paint why they paint miniatures what brought them to the hobby or what keeps them going in the hobby um, and she asked me what my personal motivators were for painting um, and I said color just just playing with color that part is really enjoyable to me and I look forward to it and and that's the the most fun part <laughs> that's what gets me up to do it um, which she classified as a process painter somebody who's just really addicted to the process and really enjoys all of those little discovery moments and things that happen throughout the course of a piece uh, and she listed several other archetypes like um, People who do it socially, who just really like the interaction of, of painting with other people. Um, and contrarily, people who do it as an escapism thing or a way to sort of isolate from their other life responsibilities or uh, like interactions, just a way to be with themselves and sort of like a meditative thing. Way to call me out, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I found this really interesting. I was wondering if you guys um, know what what you have as personal motivations for being in the hobby, and if you would 
be willing to share that because I am also really interested. This is something that I talked about with my personal trainer when I first started with him, which was what my motivations were for working out because you'll never stick to a workout routine unless it's, unless you have a reason to, unless it's something that you actually just want to do. Um, And so he tried to help me figure out why I was pursuing this and putting a name on those things helped me in those moments when I really didn't want to do it (laughs) to remember why I enjoyed doing it and why why I did want to do it. And I think the same can be true of, of painting. Sometimes the joy of it can get lost and we need to remind ourselves why we like doing it. Um, So I thought it might be helpful to list that for our own future benefit. Bryce commenting from a while back was saying tribal, and then he said glory, and I'm not sure what the glory was in reference to, and then he said just kidding. Uh, He said make the triangles stitches side by side like embroidery. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, Bryce. Some sort of like beading or embroidery. Yeah. Uh, And then Valendar said, my personal biggest motivation is, well, it's fun. I love sculpting characters and critters, especially if it's a challenge or something new. Uh, Which she did mention that the challenge of it is one of the motivators. Yeah, like an accomplishment-based thing, which I also really identified with, like having a new technique you really want to master or just like an, a complicated model that you want to tackle. Mm-hmm. I could definitely relate to that. Uh, yeah. Trash says 100% none of those. I fall into the category of practical mm-hmm. painting just to get gaming models on the table, which is objective based. It's what she's classifying you and me as in reality. Yeah. Because yeah, I learned to paint Warhammer 40 K models cause you got to have an army painted for Warhammer 40 K or everybody makes fun of you. And you don't win tournaments because they rate the paint job of your army. That's part of the scoring. So, uh, yeah, I learned to badly paint miniatures so that I didn't get zeros on paint. Um, Let's see. Valendar says, money helps because it lets me keep doing this. And he says, I also refuse to paint on commission. I keep part of the hobby just a hobby or it all becomes work. No. Yeah, that's a really good, really good idea. You did agree to do one commission for Reaper. Which Sorry? Is you, Christy, agreed to do one commission I, for Reaper. Yeah, you have to paint the sirens. Song of the... Oh, oh painting, painting commission, right? Yeah, yeah. I did yeah. do that. I did that. Which you have not started yet. They're still in the bag. But... <laughs> you will. You will do those. Uh, let's see. Bryce says, you asked what our motivation was in order for glory joke fell flat, but maybe one paint for Tony the Tiger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You paint for glory. No, that didn't fall flat. I just didn't read it in time to associate it with the question. That's That's a fantastic reason, honestly. There are a lot of people that paint for the acclaim. Yeah, 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 just yeah. like for the the notoriety, for the mm. acknowledgement. That's totally valid. Good at something. Oh, man, yeah. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Okay. Wah, wah, wah. I don't like what I made here. This is one of the reasons that I like uh, poly painting while I sculpt, because once I get to a point where I'm like, mm, I don't like painting this. This is not fun. <laughs> I just change it. Yeah. Which makes it easy if you do this before you actually put paint to the model because you can have a plan going into the model uh, that is that you are you already know you're going to be happy with. You'll have more happy accidents still with the paint but and unhappy ones. But overall, you're not going to decide... Um, I want all of this a different color now. Yeah. 
Uh, Valander says, by the way, Kyle, what you showed on the Discord shows you don't paint badly. You have excellent brush control and precision. Just learn different blending techniques and you're excellent. Yeah, so no. What I actually showed is I'm good at angles. I can hold the model to the brush at the right angle and then let my hand shake towards the model at a very specific speed <laughs> in order to get the edge that I want. Uh, but I can't blend that. My, I, I can't do that. Um, I've been working really hard on loosening up on the brush because, well, so I have really bad tremors. Probably at any given time between two and six millimeter tremor on my fingertips. So it's pretty rough and very difficult to paint that way. But, uh, yeah, just shake in the general direction of the model. But it doesn't let me blend really well because as soon as I have to hit at an angle of any kind that isn't playing with a ridge on the miniature, it's a real challenge. You can see it more in the beak of the toucan where, yeah, I've got some edges there, but that is probably 70 layers of paint trying to get those lines reasonably close. I'm, I'm heavily thinking of just doing the wobble and going oil. Because then I can just shake at it and it will be painted. Bryce says, motivation. I love to create and paint small things. I made a flapping origami bird that sits on the top of a pencil eraser. It is just fun to see what you can create. Great people in the hobby and it's nice to see, uh, it's nice to hang out. Uh, Trash says, oh, 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 Kyle, did you see the Spelljammer box set? No. I mean, I pre-ordered it. Wait, what am I missing? Epic Adventure Miniature says, I've got the Tremors too. It's a wonder that I made it out of art school. Are we Tremor brothers? We might be. So, I found a thing. I found a thing. Uh, well, Trash is telling me more about Spelljammer. Um, if I hold the back of the brush, Bryce, there's about an inch and a half of random movement at the tip of the brush that I can't control. It just looks like I'm trying to conduct a symphony. It's bad. Um, but there is a guide that I'm going to be trying that uh, the guy has tremors like us, and he has... Uh, rubber bands that he puts on his hand so that he can create negative force. So he uses like a one of those painting handle things that you use blue tack to attach the model to the top of it. And then he rubber bands his hand and his fingers to the brush and to that thing. So he has to pull substantial force against the rubber bands to get his hand to move. And that gives him quite a bit of stability. I don't know if you're like me. My issue is I have zero isotonic muscle control. It's throughout my entire body. It doesn't matter how strong or weak I get. I just don't, I can't initiate isotonic motion, which means I can't partially flex a muscle. It's either all the way on or all the way off. And I control how hard I push or pull on something by how frequently I pulse against it instead of just pull a little harder. Uh, it's dumb. But maybe one day they'll make a medicine for me. In the meantime, I do what I can. Oh, that is a cool ch case, Trash. Run for the eyes, boo. Run for the eyes. Well, slip case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bryce says, Kyle, then with the tremors, you can paint the pictures uh, that CVP likes in the museums. Yes. Yeah, I could be Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I knew that would get a laugh. Don't mock impressionist Bryce. What is wrong with you? There's a whole alternate oh, box friends. set trash with very odd cover art. I'm sure it'll be very expensive, but I like the standard one better on this one. You're getting the alternate set or you're getting the base set? Right, but they're all sold out. So now the only place you can find the alternate covers are uh, scalpers. Oh, that's probably fair. The brick and mortar stores will probably have them. Now in your concept art, you had a lot of gold in these bracer things too, but I like the bone look to them. It's supposed to be bone because the, the bracelet is made out of vertebrae and the chakras are made out of teeth. Oh. Bryce wanted to know if it is hard for me to put needles in veins. So trigger warning again, talking about blood and stuff to answer that question. Give you a second to mute me for a minute. Uh, the short of it is, for a long time I did, uh, but there is a reality in the back of an ambulance that is you are bouncing down the road at 75 mile an hour or 85 or 95 or 105, depending on the situation. And uh, roads are not flat, contrary to popular belief especially in a nine-ton ambulance. So you do a lot of bouncing, and your patients are not holding still. Uh, you just learn to hit a moving target. It's a, mm, a matter of proper bracing, gripping very, the opposite of what other people are taught to do. Because for a, a good needle stick, same thing. You should be holding it way back on the catheter and almost using it like a paintbrush. I have to do exactly the opposite. I get very close to the insertion shite. I chalk waked up tight on it, and I brace myself, and I pin their arm down against my leg, and then jab them. And it probably hurts more than when other people do it, and it probably sucks more, but I usually only have to do it once. I'm one of the better people at it that I've ever met. I'm, I've, I've mastered that skill, so. That is true. I have, I've had. My mom was a lab tech for many years. I had to help her practice. And I have now had to be stuck a few times by Kyle. And although it is absolutely horrifying seeing him come closer and closer to your arm with a frantically shaking needle. <laughs> <laughs> He's never missed. And, um, and it, it works. I don't know. He just makes it work. I try to make a joke out of it. For the patient, it's a really, it's a really <laughs> scary. <laughs> it's so I, scary. I act like I'm drunk or whatever for a second before I go and do it. Just anything to distract them from the fact that yeah, I'm shaking horribly as I come at them. But I am the one that the hospital calls from our EMS station when they can't get it. Okay, for now. With no more medical talk. Yeah, we'll be done with that for now. Uh, Trash says, y'all just need to hurry up and move to North Houston where you can get sweet alt covers. It's definitely something we've looked at. We would love to move to the woodlands, but with me uh, basically wrapping up an EMS career, career uh, and trying to switch full-time to art and Christie's business, money. All right, money's hard. Yeah. It's been a good kick, though. We've had to make a lot of adjustments, tighten our belt in a lot of ways, and uh, you know, there's just no more options of, eh, maybe you don't want to sculpt today, maybe we just want to play games or do this or do that. Like, work has to happen. Nope. <laughs> every day is a sculpt day. Well, not every day. I take Sundays off because I still think it's important to have some sort of balance. Yeah. Um, 
and set aside. I've I've found that like it doesn't work for me if I just set aside five minutes at a time to like take a break. It doesn't feel like a break. I just feel like I've been working all day. Yeah, so you could do I have that to set aside in a day, and you would feel like you'd been working <laughs> all day. So I have to like set aside designated time where I'm like, I am not working from this time to this time. And then I can feel like, okay, I took some time off. I rested. So the bone colors on these weapons, I see you're putting in what looks like some dark blue or is that red? Is it red? I see red on your swatch, so it's red. What? Where? I don't know. What color are you coloring in the shadows on your... Oh, it's a green. Oh, okay. It's like a... There's a lot of green <laughs> in this image. Um, you say that like it's obvious, and I look at this and just see orange. <laughs> right. My, I, I'm aware there are a few green so, leaves and a little green grass. So I'm like mostly focusing on these colors here on the cheek. Um, obviously not the black, but like I'm the... trying so hard to see the greens on this cheek at this scale. I know that they are because I've seen them. And I can see a little bit on the side of his nose. Oh, okay, wait, wait, here. Here's a, a good spot. Ah, no. Here's a good spot right on the edge of his face where the white of his face fur is against the dark black of his, yeah, or the dark. I see it. You see the, you see the yeah. green? Okay. okay, now I see it against the black spots again. Okay. You know, and yeah. Okay, now I see it all over the place. And there's like, there's this really subtle salmon color, right? And you just see that green? You don't have to like yeah. study it. You're just like, what colors are there? Oh, it's green. Yeah. Screw you. <laughs> There's this really beautiful little like salmon color right here. No, there's it, no salmon color. It's so subtle. It's you're, so subtle. You're messing but with it's this like now. but it's beautiful. No. Yes. No. Do you not see it? Really? Now you're just being condescending. No, no, I'm just asking if you're <laughs> no, if I'm you're quite messing serious. with me. I do not see salmon. Oh, okay. Um okay, so right in the center of the cheek. Center so of the, the cheek. Yeah, the, the eye is on the left side. The triangle weird. Yeah, you see the thing. triangle shape. Yeah. Just to the left of the triangle shape. So the other triangle shape. Next to it. Right. Okay. Um, that's all got that salmon color in it. What? And then. No. The no, no. <laughs> Not and then, because I still don't see the salmon there. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna help though. Go okay. down. Go down from there. There's the All black right. horizontal line. Yeah. Right? Okay, we're going to go underneath that horizontal line. So down by the bottom of his face. Right. Okay. Down as it recedes, it starts to get more saturated as it recedes into uh, the shadow. There's like a... Do you see it? I have to like squint my eyes and look cross-eyed at it. And then all of a sudden, the orange in his cheek, cheek turns salmon. Yeah. It's like a that's like so a weird. But I gotta salmon. like defocus my eyes and squint one real funny. <laughs> Sam, um, Epic so, says, "Yeah, all over that cheek, salmon cheeks." Yeah, salmon, all over that. <laughs> and now I see it in the zoomed out one. That's so trippy. Yeah, I definitely would not have seen that before. I never would have been like, "Oh, I need to paint that salmon." But it's so subtle, right? Like. You can see it now that you can yeah. see it, but but in the overall impression of the image, it's not there. It's like it's very subtle. Bryce is with me. That's hard to see. I'm sure he's with me. He hasn't commented, but I know he is. So I'm I'm just putting that, I'm just sprinkling that a little bit into the, the teeth colors. And I think you can see it like it just sort of brings out the other colors. It makes them all... It just enhances. Otherwise, it's a little bland. Okay, let, hang on. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> let me see yeah. if I can take this back here. Okay, so here it is before I put in the... Oh, oh no, no, no. What'd I do? I don't know. What'd you do? Go back. Go back. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, 
Oh, who's that kid with the Oreo cookie? What? What is happening? Ah! Oh. Oh my god! No, no, no! What did you do? Stop! 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 Uh, We're going to clear this canvas. (laughs) What? (laughs) What? (laughs) I hope that there's a recent save. Well, that's interesting. Bryce says, I see the salmon. The green is still top unless the black is sort of green as it filters through the white whiskers. Valandar says, you turned off edit. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing that on on purpose to try to get this to go away. Okay. Mm. Okay, wait. Did I save it? All right. Maybe I saved it. Let's go back up through our history here. Please. Please. I've saved this. (laughs) And then you hit switch instead of do not switch. We have it back. All right. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go back step by step here, so I don't go back too far and just yeah. drive my whole ZBrush crazy. But I put this in so lightly. Ever so lightly. Okay, so like, so here's my salmon that I've picked. Which is like pretty central orange. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we'll we'll do it on these because I haven't touched these yet. So you see these bones, and I've got like kind of a a darker tan for the base, and I've colored in a little bit of desaturated like a gray green at the roots. Yeah. Right. Now, it's kind of an orange tan. Is that right, or is that a yellow tan? The yeah. tan? It's it's a yellow tan, okay. for sure. Um, I'm going to come in here with just a little bit of green, like a white green on the tips. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then... So you're highlighting them with green. Now I'm going to come in with a touch of that salmon color. And this is where the color complexity starts to kick in. Just this right. little bit of salmon. You see how that just like makes it, it just sort of like enhances all of those other yeah. colors. How did you pick that? Why did you pick that? Uh, because it was in the, the area I was trying to mimic color-wise for this bone which is and the so cheek. I was like right the cheek and so I was looking okay so where's my shadow colors my shadow colors are going to be this desaturated olive and I'll put that as my root And then primarily, it's this yellowy tan color. And then just for that little bit of complexity, there's the the salmon. Now, if you were exaggerating those colors on the tiger, how would you exaggerate this? Um, I mean, I... I could go I could definitely go more saturated with this and like really pump up this salmon color here. And then um there's like a a color at the corner of the eye, the inner inner corner of the eye, where it's still on the orangey fur, not on the white fur, but like where it's still sort of on the orangey fur, there's a purple there. Yeah. Um, yeah. A bright blue too. Yeah, 
Yeah, that because of the white. The white is giving you that that blue. But I would come in and add in some of these purples on the underneath shadowy side of some of this. Maybe sort of like as a bounced light from the ground, even though the ground's not purple, but I would I would just sort of pretend like that's where it's getting <laughs> <laughs> getting some of this purple color. Bryce says, I guessed right. Go purple. <laughs> Good job, Bryce. So you can see it just like, it just gives it some dimension that it didn't have before. Yeah. And now what would you do for the cloth wraps on these bone disc weapons. I've been really debating that this whole time, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but what I think I'm going to do, just to be thematic with the tiger, is make the leather a black leather. Oh, okay. Which I'm not going to lay in straight black. Shame on you if you thought that's what I was going to do. <laughs> oh. You had me going there because you put straight black in the hair. So you picked it. You're telling us you're not putting straight black, but then not telling us what you're doing. So you told us what uh, not I'll to say. do. So here, so here, like this would be like straight black, right? All the way bottom left. No color. Right. No value. And you only really ever go there for non-metallic metallics. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't think it's ever useful really. But so I'm I'm coming like right in here. I want to give it a little bit of color, well a little bit of warmth and enough light to it that I can um go down or up in value if I want to for shadowing. Also, don't ask me how these teeth are actually attached because I clearly didn't think about that when I sculpted this. I was just like, I don't know. She glued them on. <laughs> Price says, okay, good tip. Good tip. Don't go there. Never all the way black. Yeah. I don't I never... Like, I guess you could shade a very dark like this, like where I'm already trying to paint it black and I'm already really, really dark in value, you might be able to add that into like line or shade a color like this, but I don't know that I've, it's even really necessary. I've taken non-metallic metallic classes now a few times for most of the very accomplished non-metallic metallic painters. Uh didn't you take it with Aaron Lovejoy? Aaron Lovejoy was the one that was the most memorable because he's just such a memorable guy. Yeah, uh, he is. That's true. And he, that was his statement, that the only time you ever go white-white or black-black is a black line right next to a white line for non-metallic metallic. -metallic. Uh, you could also do it if you were trying to make something look plastic. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Valandar says, he's the dragon famous, you know. He is dragon famous. Now, Proctor, no, not Proctor. I'm trying to remember who else taught the non-metallic metallic class. I thought Proctor did once. I think I took that his class too, but like at our first ReaperCon, I think. I'm not sure who the teacher was. It was way over my head at the time. And then uh, not a class, but Wapple did a stream on non-metallic metallics. And he's in your camp. He thinks everything should be color. 
Yeah. We are going to have ribbons for you this year. Yeah. I said he told he told Aaron that he needs Aaron. to have a Reprocon ribbon dragon famous. Yeah, he should. 100% he should. And I want one. Uh, Valendar says, I know my favorite MM, MMM, and the one he'd love to be able to replicate is what Rhonda Bender did on Baron Black Tree. You're going to have to give me more to go on the that. I don't know what that is. Valendar says, It's not super polished, it looks kind of worn, but well taken care of, and not rusty. Perfect for adventure or armor. Uh. Now, the difference there is most of these painters take a very abstract approach to non-metallic metallic. They're looking at things like a bronze post or a, uh, a sword that's just in a room and it's just a picture of the sword and noticing that it's a little bit of the surrounding colors. And it's just kind of an abstract splotching on of paint, which for speed painting is pretty effective. And then you get the approach for uh, uh, Wapple, who literally paints miniature... <laughs> Oh, sorry. Who literally makes little miniature paintings for all of the reflections of all of his metal. If you look at his armies, it's the same skyline painted on the helmets and breastplates of the entire regiment. Which makes sense. And when you see that as a unit, it looks very uniform. And it looks like metal. It looks flawless but that's what you'd actually see and so there are these little impressionistic landscapes done whether that is a volcano or a tree some forest it's really interesting i like i like his approach it's way way outside of my skill set but it's cool yeah he does some really impressive Stuff with metal. So these look more brown than black to me. Yeah, I think I brought a little too much <laughs> color into it. I think I'm going to have to tone it down. Bryce says, just found a use for the tremors. Profession, non-metallic non, non, non painter. How are you choosing where to put the black on this? And why? So I'm just like, even this isn't a pure black, you can see, but I'm just putting this in the, the recesses, essentially like lining, um, if, which is a, a common mini painting technique. But if you're unfamiliar with it, it's just um, delineating lines as if you were doing a comic book or something. You could do this with a wash too then, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just being very specific about adding in this extra dark into the crevices and cracks to try to bring some of the overall depth back to it. I think this does read like maybe a very, really dark, dark brown, but I feel like I've seen this sort of leather we live in Texas, and there's a lot of, like, horses around here. Yeah. And in my experience, 
with various saddles and leathers. I I know that I've seen this color leather before. To be clear, it's not like there are horses riding through town. No. no. <laughs> you say we live in Texas. There are a lot of horses, and I've seen a lot of saddles. I mean, you got to go to places where there are horses, like horse parks and right, yeah. farms. I just mean like I've I've had the experiences of horses probably more frequently than other people. But I re I think this is a really believable dark leather because I feel like I've I've seen this type of reflection in the polished leather for horses. And I think I'm going to make these wraps dark, too. I was debating whether I wanted both wrists to have light color, so then make these light like the bones on the other one. Mm. But I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'd rather keep these leathers more uniform. It gives an odd number of the leather, too, which is good, right? Yeah. Now, that's a thing you haven't really talked about, but I know is a major factor for you when you're selecting the color for a particular area of a model is the tempo or pacing of the color. And I will not attempt to explain that, but maybe you want to touch on it. Um, yeah, so for whatever reason, the human brain prefers asymmetry or unevenness in terms of like feeling organic and natural. Uh, so to that end, um, compositions that rely on the elements within it being not even, not symmetrical, tend to be more likable or successful. So, for instance, the, the leathers, like you were discussing, I'm using this same color, this, this brown, leather color here for her hair and her her face like her eyebrows are also but that doesn't really count as a separate instance of it because it's all in the same like area right. um, so the, her hair here is that color this uh, chakram here this one here that's three this band here's four and then her armband up here is five. And five is a nice uh, non-even color. Non-even um, number. I don't yeah. know why I said color. Because I've been saying color a lot, that's why. Now, the rhythm of that is important as well, right? Not just the count. Right, you you want to spread it out so that basically if there are three yellow things in a picture, your your eye will naturally find those patterns and so it will look for the other instances of that color throughout the piece. And you can use that to direct the eye. So if you you want to make sure somebody is taking in the whole piece, not just like stuck in the top half or the bottom half. 
um, you can make sure that you repeat that color in various places so that the eye finds the pattern and it forces your eye to go through the rest of the piece. Now, you can also use the, uh, oh, what's the word for it? The, the type of pacing of it, right? So if they're getting closer and closer together as you move through the piece, that does one thing. If they're staying steady distance apart, that does something else. Or if they're getting further and further apart, well, or will that even happen? Will it always? Will your eye always try to move towards the more close together parts? I know uh, you talked to me about this years ago, but I don't remember it well enough. Yeah. So, like, have you ever have you ever looked at sheet music? Yeah, I remembered you using music as an example. <laughs> Um, even if you don't read sheet music, even if you don't like understand how to read sheet music, um, or interpret it, you can look at the pattern of the notes and sort of tell how, how the tempo is going to go. Like, well, this part speeds up. There's a lot of stuff here. Well, this part is slowing down because there's only three notes in this whole section of bars. So you can sort of get a sense of like how complex or fast something may be just by the symbols that you're seeing on the page, even if you don't really understand notes. Um, and it's the same thing with color. You can, you can control sort of how, how a piece feels or where the eye wants to go by putting those instances of color strategically either farther apart or closer together. Um, or whether there's a lot of little instances of it or if there's like one big instance of it and then some smaller supporting elements. Which way will your eye move? If you're using that to try to influence eye movement, how would you go about that? Um, so if you're if you're going to go with like I'm I'm using the technique here of like the one larger occurrence, which is the hair, and then several smaller occurrences, which are mainly these weapons here and the, the leathers on the other arm. And I'm using that because one, obviously we're going to be drawn to the face first and foremost, because as a human being, we're instantly going to look at the face first. So we're going to take in this larger shape first, and then instantly we're going to start looking for repeating colors. So I see that and I'm like, where else does that exist? Oh, down here at the chakra. Wait, what is this? And I turn this around. Oh, here's another one. Oh, here's this other thing. And then I'm sort of finding. It becomes this sort of discovery process as I make my way around the model. And your eye will do that and even control your hand. I hadn't thought about that. But there are definitely models that you've painted that I would pick up and just look at straight on before you painted it. But after you've painted it, I start rotating it almost right. immediately. You're like, so, wait, where is that? Where does that exist? Is it is that other places? That's interesting because <laughs> I look at this and I do. I expect a third piece of that brown to be somewhere. I would yeah. probably expect more of it if it was a closer match to the color patterns in the hair but you really popped up those maroons or reds in the hair, yeah. and they, mo they don't really exist at all that I can see in the weapons. Are you going to be bringing that into the weapons as well? I mean, I could, but I don't think I'm going to. I think it's close enough um, to, to make the correlation and different enough to be interesting. One of the things I'm doing is I am not making this armband that same color very intentionally, because if I had made that armband the same color, and we'll just, you know, do that to experiment, all of a sudden there is no reason to look anywhere else. You have three of them. It makes the odd number, hmm. and you're sort, of, you're sort of done looking. 
You're like, yep, yeah, okay, that exists. That's interesting. Yeah. So you're avoiding that color there. Well, because I've made this a lighter brown, so it doesn't match, you're like, okay, here's one and two. Is it is it anywhere else? Oh. And then you start looking. That's fascinating. Uh, Epic Adventure Miniature says, using relative lightness, darkness as a form of contrast to lead the eye. That's a different thing, right? Or is that the same thing? So you're talking about like contrast, like value contrast to control the eye? I think that's what he's talking about, yeah. Just want to understand the question. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, there is definitely an element to the, the value of it, right? The only thing you see from this angle that is that value are those browns. Um, that's the only thing that's that dark from this yeah. perspective. Um, but it's the same with, it could be the same with anything else, right? Like, like this, uh, anything you could make a pattern out of. So that could be shapes, that could be colors, that could be shapes. Yeah. I don't know what else. Um, Saturation. Like if in a drawing, in a drawing, you can do it with lines, like a line weight or a type of line. Um, people will look for a similar line. It, you know that's interesting. You could do it with anything you could create contrast with, right? So the Book right, of Waffles yeah. cites the seven forms of contrast, and I've got to try to remember what they are. So he had. <laughs> I don't remember them either because he uses some that I consider the same thing, and then others well, that I'm like, that ah, I don't know. Until we talked about it for a couple hours, and then you were like, no, I guess yeah, because he had value, yeah. hue, saturation which are the three everybody knows about. And then you can get into shape, which is a little more tricky, more art schooly, backgroundy stuff. Uh, and line weight, which all were intuitive to you when he said them. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then there was uh, temperature. Temperature. So which, like warm, warm or cool. And then line weight. Well, uh, the other was texture, like having oh, something that's brush. smooth versus, yeah, he said brush strokes, brush strokes but yeah. essentially texture, things that are smooth versus rough or like more patterned versus yeah, not, not patterned. And even just the direction that you paint, right? If you, especially since he works in oil, so there's a good amount of brush texture to everything he paints. And so any of those things you could create that contrast in a rhythmic nature across your piece to direct the eye, control the eye. Or I guess, as I'm having my mind open to right now, cause the viewer to want to turn the model around yeah. and see the other side. That's interesting. Which is particularly important with this piece because she doesn't have one great viewing angle. This was an experiment with what, what if you have a model that, in order to consume it, you have to turn it? So you cannot see both of her weapons from one side, which is, generally speaking, a no-no. You cannot see the majority of her body from the same side you can see her face from. Uh, one of the two primary viewing angles, you, you can only see two colors. Oh, Brush for Hire just rated us with 77 people. <laughs> thank you thank you we were having such fun watching your your stream earlier today i hope you had a fantastic stream and that you are able to get some downtime now you stream so much i mean it's always super i always i love watching you work your color palettes are always inspiring and I just love the community. You've done such a great job at building up a fun community to be a part of. I appreciate that. And we definitely have to do some collab stuff because that sounds super fun. Let's see. We got first-time chat viewers. Stefan Page giving us some 
raid shouts. Brush for Ire says, uh. LOL, I appreciate that. It's always amazing. I love it. And Sculpt is looking amazing also. Thanks. Uh, I'm doing some painting today, too. <laughs> thank you for the follows. Thank you for all the follows. I cannot see who is following because Twitch is being a nightmare today. So I, it's super appreciated. Mega appreciated. Uh, DigBaddy72 said, Woohoo, look for any button to push that says, Don't touch it. <laughs> Don't touch it. Uh, Brush says, Like why you, your sculpts are amazing and beg me to paint them. Certainly do. Uh, let's see. We're we were really especially loving that. Uh, I don't even know what you call it. The monarch demon, the butterfly demon that you were showing oh, off earlier. So cool. Oh, man, just so epic. We we didn't have a lot of people here prior to you joining, but if you don't already follow Brush for Hire, please do. And Brush, if you've got yeah. links to throw up or something. Do that for too. sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's got a really great Discord community too. Good place to network and and just meet other creative minds. So we're doing color study today here. Yeah, let's have some links. Let's see it all. On uh, your fourth model you ever sculpted, this is Zariah, the Zulu Ranger, which is not just, like, you got some grief about name appropriation, appropriation, but it actually isn't. Like, she's modeled after Zulu, traditional Zulu garb, and all of the designs and styles are, are just that, right? It was intentional. It was... <laughs> I promise. It was not uneducated. Uh, if you do, I'll throw some links up. There's a link I put up in the to the Etsy store, so that's there. And uh, Christy didn't warn me we were working on this model today, so she's not on the Etsy store, but she will be later today. Uh, and then... I only recently updated her with this textured base, but I think it really adds to the story component we always had like a, a strong story for her in our minds you and i as yeah. i was working on her but i think that it's now more visible for everyone to see and then there's the my mini factory store the brush for hire coupon code should work people were having trouble with that earlier i cannot find a reason for that to not be working so uh, give it a shot. It might have been a time zone thing. I don't know. Well, I hope but that so. should also be a 20% off everything in the store for Brush for Hire. Such great people. Thank you for the raid. Yeah. Uh, we're talking today about color complexity and using color references for painting. Uh, we're doing it digitally because we can do it a lot faster. But uh, you've won multiple trophies for painting and stuff like that, too. So this is not a you can't yeah. paint with a brush. It's just much faster to demonstrate on a stream in this fashion. Yeah, and, and easier to see <laughs> than trying to, like, hold it up to a camera. We also need to get... I have, I have never gotten that to work well, the camera situation. We also need to get all of these painted digitally because uh, your only game store is going to be doing 3D yeah. prints that are in color also. So that's going to be coming yeah, very soon. So, I was so excited about this. Like, I know th the color 3D printing is sort of like the tech isn't all there just yet. Um, it's, got, it's got some time to get really cool, but... 
I'm so looking forward to it because I think it's going to be really, really <laughs> rewarding to be able to just like print out something I poly painted and have that in my hands for my game. Uh, we've talked a lot about looking for things in this image, uh, like the purples in the tiger, which several of us spent a good half hour trying to find the purples Christy was talking about in the tiger. But they're there. <laughs> we finally found them. Or that this tiger apparently has a green face. Who knew? Yeah, yeah. We are 45 minutes past our normal stream time. That's okay. We can do this for a while. We tend to be doing quite a bit lately. <laughs> We've been going over time, which is okay uh, now in the summer. Um, yeah. But next month, when the kids go back to school, we're going to have to be strict about it. Brush for Hire says 100% working on the theory versus the technique is totally different. There needs to be mo yeah. more focus on color theory because it makes a piece so much more impactful. And he said, yep, painting what you actually, what you, wait a minute, painting what you are actually seeing versus what you know. Yeah, that's what we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. You got it, you got it. Imagine that, brush for hire, knows the material. <laughs> huh. <laughs> yeah. Who to thunk it? Yeah, that's exactly right. Like, we look at this tiger, and me personally, I see orange and black, and some yellow if I'm really getting complicated, and some white. But finding out that there are purples, and oranges, and greens, and blues all over this tiger, and how Christie's been using that to uh, do that same thing on this model, which I look at her now, and I'm like, I don't. I watched you put the blues and the greens on her skin, but other than a few places where it's currently like bled over from just a little bit of slop here and there, I can't see it. He says, uh, Brush says, LOL, more so by making lots of mistakes. Now he yeah. was talking about doing a collaboration with you on his stream. Yeah, I would love, I would love that. That could be really interesting. Yeah, we gotta do that. I don't know what that would look like, what we would do with it, or, or what, but it's gonna have to happen. It would look cool. That would definitely look cool, whatever it is. But would that be a chibi? Because both of you are really into chibis. Or would that be a super serious, gory model? Because that's out of your comfort zone, and that would encourage you to get out of your comfort zone. Well, see, here's the thing. He and I share a love of the whimsical. Yeah. He just he just likes it with a little more edge than I do. Yeah. So we'd have to like meet in the middle somewhere. Or I just have to break out of my comfort zone entirely. That's okay, too. I mean, they're both perfectly good directions to go. It'd be interesting. That's why I say I don't know what that would look like. That could be cool for a wide variety of possibilities. Man, I really just... Uh, I love the richness in the color of her hair. And I don't want to mess it up. But it looks a little plastic, doesn't it? But, like, if you're looking at the way that the hair naturally highlights, it definitely has these higher points yeah. of, of light. And even in the, the tiger reference, when we're looking at, like up here at the top of the shoulder, uh -huh. um, this black line as it really hits that highlight, um, you can see it on the this light side of the face too, but more so up here in the shoulder. There's some good high reflection, some very light right. color. You get that gray. Yeah, I think the hair needs some highlights. I don't think you're going to mess it up. I think it's silly 
I don't know why you ever worry about messing something up, particularly in ZBrush, which has an undo button. So I don't get it. Do it. Well, here's here's my question though. Okay. You see this the the tail, the black stripes on the tail in the oh. light. Oh. Uh -huh. Where it's got that that color, that uh -huh. pinkish orangey what? color. Pinkish orange? No. That's tan, right? Okay. Tan. I'm sure there's pinkish orange there. I'm 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 I don't see it yet, so help me see the pinkish orange. Um I mean it's a it's just like a less vibrant version of uh Right, hang on. Because you've been right every time. And I don't believe myself. So let me pull up our bigger version of the tiger. And we'll zoom in on the tail. Much bigger tiger. Because we've had to do this. So, Holy crap. His tail's pink. Yeah, like this whole back leg here, as it fogs out in that, in that sort pink. of haze, gets pink. Why is it pink? Um, the reflection of the red clay is bouncing oh. up into the white on the tail. And it's, it's turning it pink. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I want to use that color, that pink color there, or if I want to take some of this bluish gray from the top of the nose Why not and both? make it more cool. I guess I could do the cool color on the back side and then the warmer color on the front side where the light would hit more directly. Yeah, I feel like arbitrarily limiting yourself to one of them doesn't suit you. And then if you don't like one, you just do the the other way, right? Yeah, that's fair. Had to plug in my headset. Sorry for the weird audio there for a moment. Okay, so why is it that this looks a little bit plastic toy in the hair? I know we're fixing that now. Can you explain it to us? Because uh, it's nothing that's organic is that flatly colored. Like you're never gonna get something that's just like a flat purple, unless it's plastic. Okay. So. So we just read the flatter, and I we've brought at first. The hair was the most complex color on the model, right? Because that's kind of where we started, started up there. Um, and so it was the most realistic feeling thing. But now that we've added all of this color complexity throughout the rest of the model and it's sort of reading as a cohesive piece now, we got to go back and like refine it so it matches. Okay. Uh, Brush said he does have he he does have to raid and run now. Uh, have a great stream. Thank you. We'll we'll see you later. Have a good day. Go give him a follow, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're gonna want to check him out. Good stuff. Bryce, I think you. So here's Facebook, where if you're not familiar already. Yeah. Here's where we can start talking a little bit about rhythm, too, because we're going to get a bunch of these little staccato moments of highlight, mm. uh, which I guess if you're not familiar with music, that might be a weird word. Um, small, fast-paced tempo, something that's very, like... Okay. Imagine like a like a Morse code or something. Uh -huh. yeah, that's a good. Would assumption. be like would be like a staccato sound. Uh. Let's hear your Morse code Morse code impersonation. <laughs> I used to do that with my dog's ears. I would like bounce her little ears. Beep 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 beep. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> That was Jin Jin. She didn't like it. No, that was a uh, Dee Dee. That was like my dog when I was like five. Oh, okay. <laughs> my parents' dog. 
Um, so we're sort of like scattering this in a really like a spray. If you think of like a shotgun, like a shotgun spray where it just sort of like hits a general target in a mm -hmm. in a radius instead of like pinpointed like we did on the cheek. Right. The analogies I come with on the spot are just so weird. <laughs> well, shooting your model with a shotgun in the face seems <laughs> graphic, but we'll we'll roll with it. Not what I was going for, but okay. So you see how we really like played up the dimension in these curls now. Yeah. Now are you going to go use that other color that you found? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now we're going to go use this um, blue-gray, which is actually like <laughs> more blue than gray. Now make sure when you're done with this, you save it as a ZPR, because I can make a time lapse of the painting. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I can make a time lapse. Yeah, with that whole hiccup of like everything going everywhere. We'll have to edit that part out. Right. Okay, so this is the grayish color that we found, right? Yeah, so this is this is blue. It's like a gray blue. It's very far to the left, so it's very gray. It doesn't have a whole lot of color to it. But it's about Lower mid value. Thank you for the follow. Oh, we thank can't you. see who's following because stream gave us a nightmare today. So Yeah, the Twitch thing is, is acting up, so we don't know who's following us, but thank you for following. Whoever that was, thank you. Feel free to speak up in chat so we know who you are. Uh, and Chromatic Miniatures says he's a great guy, referring to Brush for Hire. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So cool and so talented. I don't know if he ever talks about, like, if he, is his real name something that he keeps secret? I don't know his real name. I don't know that it's, like, necessarily a secret, but I don't know it. Yeah, I just know him as Brush for Hire. Like, I I watched his stream before you started streaming. I actually think that I went a little overboard on this. I think I want to... Hmm. Tone this back down a little. I want to focus this a little more. So, like, I think I went a little too broad. I want to keep the highlights more centralized and downplay some of these edge or no. edge edges more. Would you be better off to go back and mute what you've already done, or better off to yes. just further highlight the highlights? I just want to mute what I what I already did on the edges, okay. which I did. I just want to like focus that light a little more. Mm -hmm. um, on the top. Concentrated, yeah. So there, there we go. So now she's got some definition in her back curls, and some heavy definition in the front curls, where the okay. light is. Now you did this. Which you would do with like a stippling effect in real paint. That's how you would like. You would just like. Yeah. Now you did this, and it's effective, but you haven't explained why. Why you did it, what was your goal, and why this was the correct approach to get your result. So, wait, okay. wait, we got the new button. We got the new button. The explain that button. Where is that? Explain that. There you go. Boom. Push the button. Haha. <laughs> Explain that. Uh, okay, so so the problem was that we were feeling like it was too flat, right? That was the issue that we saw, was that it was just overall, it wasn't feeling as complex or realistic as the rest of the piece. Mm -hmm. So once we knew what the problem was, we had to identify the cause. And the you cause of that... Use the undo slider to 
show us what you were looking at when you were talking about that? Yeah. Uh, maybe. I really hope this doesn't, like, go nuts. I think I, I, think I did it. I think it, it doesn't like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then we won't do that. First time. Uh, chat well, now viewer we're says, now we're gonna have to wait. Okay. First time chat viewer Monkey Snacks says hi. Where am I? LOL. Hello. I'm gonna tell him who you are, Christy. Or I guess I can do that. We are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are here Christine. with Christine Van Patten. She is a miniature sculptor and painter. She's done sculpts for Reaper Miniatures, Dark Sword, uh, 3D printed tabletop, lots of others. I'm sure you probably. If you have a lot of models, you have some of her stuff on her shelf, probably on your shelf, probably somewhere. What'd you do? Uh, I apparently took that slider way, way back machine. Oh. Uh, and today we are doing a color study on uh, one of her very early models. This is Zariah, the Zulu Ranger, who's uh, wearing traditional Zulu garb and with some creative weapons Christy came up with. Uh, and we're talking about doing a, a a paint on this using color reference material. So in this case, she's using the tiger because, well, I'll turn that back over to you now that I've done the introduction. Uh, so I chose the reference picture because I felt like it really encapsulated the mood that I wanted to achieve with the character um, that she's fierce she's dangerous she's calculated uh, and she's on the hunt that was, that was what I wanted to get um, I knew already that I wanted the sort of green and orange palette because that's what I had originally planned to do with her um, I did a very very early poly paint of her back when I was first learning how to do this in ZBrush. Um, so it's super basic. And I figured it would be fun to come back and really do her some better justice. <laughs> now that I've given her a new base and everything. I love the base on this model. The big yeah, footprint. Yeah, super cool. Super fun. Yeah. I think I want to like... Maybe tone this down a bit more so you get a little more contrast in here. Yeah, I think the footprint could use some more contrast too, if that's not what you were talking about. That's what I was talking about. Uh, Christy also sculpts for her own miniature line now, Moonlight Minis, which is the name of the channel. Uh, and you can find her stuff on either... My mini factory to print yourself or on Etsy. And I'll try to find a link for you. There's the My Mini Factory. And we'll see if we can find a link to the Etsy. Sorry again for the lack of bots and stuff like that. We really tried and broke a bunch of stuff in our efforts. So I need to find somebody that knows this better than me that can walk me through it when we're not in the middle of streaming. That'd be great. There we go. I like that better. Yeah. And there are the links. Now, now that I've added these highlights to her hair, I feel like I've created maybe too much of a disparity between the hue of her hair and the hue of the chakra leather. Yeah, they don't match anymore. Um, so I think I'm going to have to go back in and add some purple, in, or like this magenta-y purple thing in here. Now we've got a bunch of people here that weren't here when we were talking about that before. So could you talk to us some, while you're doing that, just reiterate the goal yeah. of color repetition. So, so um, we want to draw the eye around the the figure by giving your brain some patterns to follow and one of the tricks for that is that your brain likes to look at the same color and find uh, 
other instances of that color. So we're using that to our advantage. Um, also, it likes uneven numbers. So once it finds an uneven number, it sort of gives up on looking for more things because it's like, yeah, I found it. That's all I needed. Uh, so I'm only including two instances of this color in the front of the model, which would be your primary viewing angle. Um, first in this hair, and then in this weapon, which will hopefully pique your curiosity enough to come look around the image towards the back and find some similarities here in the other occurrences. We're going to use some of the blue that we used in the highlights of the hair back here. Uh, which is also like, just generally speaking, um, a good idea to have a cooler and a warmer side to your model. The cooler side being the one further away from the main viewing angle. Oh, okay. This is not, this is not always the case, right? Because sometimes you have a very specific cool light that you want as your main viewing light. Um, in which case you would have warmer backside as a contrast. But um, typically you in miniatures, there's a heavy lighting scenario. There's usually like, it's not usually just like uniformly lit where everything is uh, shaded equally. There's usually a more dramatic lighting situation because it just makes for a more striking piece on the table um, or for competition. So because of that, you don't want half of your model to just be black and disappear into shadow generally. Um, so we create a rim light or a cooler side that's lit by maybe more ambient light or more uh, or a, sm a smaller light source. Now as you've talked about, as you've continued to develop different parts, you start to see more and more earlier parts you worked on are lacking a little something. Like the, I don't, are those feathers on her right upper arm? Yeah. They seem to be missing something. Also, the braid around her arm, Valandar had made the comment earlier that he envisioned the, that being a lock of her mother's hair that she had tied around her arm. Oh, that's interesting. Which I thought was a cool little story piece there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Might have to steal that when we write the character card. I had actually originally... Uh, when I was sculpting this model and I was like wanting a shape over here and I wasn't sure what kind of shape I wanted. Uh, I was like, what do I put over here? And then I had decided that one of the natural animals in her general area was very chocobo-esque and had these vibrant yellow feathers oh. that she stole for her Man, bedazzlement. You've just been on a chocobo kick since the announcement I mean, this of the Final Fantasy VII remake. Like, since they first started talking about that, like, eight years ago, <laughs> you've been all about the chocobo. I like Togobo. They're the best. Now the those feathers still seem a little flat. 
So if you were going to amp the colors in them, what would you do? Where would you go? Where would you find those colors? Uh, well, first, I would look at <clears throat> what in the image in my reference, my color reference image, what matches um, closely in terms of hue for what I want to capture in the feathers. Uh -huh. um, and it's really hard to say because you know, I might actually, now that I'm looking at it, I might just change it to to capture some of this white that's in the fur. Oh, okay. And do like some of this cooler blue white that we don't really have represented anywhere. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. You can save. Please don't crash. You should probably intentionally save at some point. You are correct. I should. Because I don't know that you've given your computer enough time to rest to save the entire time we've been working on this. Probably not. Let's um, just go ahead and say, oh, that's an undo history. <laughs> 2,589 strokes. It's a lot. Yeah. And this is one of those things where, like, you wonder how long this would have taken you how many strokes this would have taken you in real paint? So many. Tens of thousands. So many. Essentially, poly painting is like using the most controlled airbrush you could possibly use. Well, that's fair. Because it, it responds like an airbrush. It just sort of like sprays a color. But you can control the size of your brush so you can make it really, really, really specific or really, really broad. So where did you find us from, Monkey Snacks? You came back to your computer and you were in our stream, I suspect. Uh, were you with Brush for Hire? Is that where you came from? Uh, Eddie3D says, Bian Megan Bazi Kier Carden. I don't know what that means. What? It's in a different language, but he's a first-time chat viewer. Hello, Eddie 3 Ah, hello. I Welcome to the chat. I wonder if I can find a translator. Copy. Okay, so first I'm going to lay in a gray. The danger in making this white is that it's going to be a much lighter value than almost anything else. So we don't want it to draw too much attention away from the face, which is our focal point, of course. Right. And that's going to be a danger with the white, right? Right, yeah, because white is such a such a light value, and you, I mean, the good news is, like, the white shadows for white will never get below a halfway point on the value scale, which is something that people do wrong a lot of times when they paint white, is that they, they try to paint white, and then they want to up their contrast a lot. And so then they just like get darker and darker and darker and then they paint it with these black shadows or very, very dark shadows and then it doesn't look white anymore. Um, that's because you can't get that dark and still have it be white. White doesn't reflect that dark. So <laughs> if you want it to read as a white object, keep it in, keep your shadows no lower than the half like white here. White. Like a halfway point. Proko did a really great demonstration in one of his free videos. 
about uh, value mapping, where he just starts his image by either mapping everything to the halfway point or to the light point. So he just went through and picked out all the very dark parts on the model and shaded them halfway to, the, to his halfway point and left everything else alone. And then for the rest of his piece, he just doesn't allow himself to take everything that was in the top end of the spectrum below the top half of the spectrum. And then the same thing for the lower part. He doesn't let himself raise anything but back up out of that spectrum, which is a great tip for somebody like me that I don't have that ability to look at something and just go, oh, that's a value of about 80%, and manage that on the fly. It really helps me keep the shadows where shadows go and the highlights where highlights go. In a mini, you can accomplish that a lot with a zenithal prime, though uh, that's not necessarily always going to hold true because, again, your blacks and dark colors are going to have a much lower value than the zenithal prime will give you. So it's a good starting point, but you still have to go back in and block some stuff in. Same thing with your zenithal prime, like you're talking about painting it white. You're going to have to go paint the dark parts of the white objects white over your zenithal prime, or they won't look white, right? Yeah. I see, like, this is, it's way too high key. Yeah. So here it's compete it's competing way too much with the the other elements of the composition just drawing all of your attention. Now the other thought that I have here is you could either tone that back down see if I you can tell me how right or wrong I am here. My thought would be you could either tone that down and make it more of a gray than a white or you could bring more of the white that's in the tiger's face around its eyes around her eyes. The tiger has those black lines with white around them, which is a really super poppy contrast. And I don't know if you could get away with that on her face. Um, I mean, I could like play up a little bit more. If I, if I were going to do that, what I would probably do is let's see where that blue is. It's about here. What I would do is, like, give her some sort of war paint. Oh. And that's a super cool idea. You know, to, like, to bring in that color in the face. Which is something Anne was talking about on her stream earlier today. Or were symbols, although that looks very clown-like with how red you have the nose. So you'd have to do something slightly different. But oh, I like the dots. The dots are sort of repeating this staccato in the hair. Yeah. Which then gives you three instances of that whitish color. One for each eye and one for the armband, right? Um, no, because the eyes would really act as just one. Um, so I would need something like down here. We can't see where here to, is. To, uh, like at her, her boot or somewhere down like in the mud or something. Mm. Right about here, I would need another instance of it. That way... It would essentially, if you draw a triangle, you could draw a triangle throughout this whole piece. I see. If you had that, if you counted each of those as a corner, and then you try to decide where do I want a third point, well, you'd want it either down here by the front of the foot or down in the center of the image so that you, you take in the whole now, piece. You're touching on a topic that probably half the viewers don't know what you're talking about. So if you can elaborate on that a little more, what are you talking about with this triangle? Why is that important? And uh, how does it work? 
What do you? How do you use that to your advantage? So this is probably what I would do. Actually, is I would, if this were a real model, I would fill this with resin, and mm. paint this that same smoky white blue, so that it looks like a puddle. But you could do that anyway. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna do it anyway, but. It would be more convincing if it were <laughs> yeah. resin instead of just paint. But And then we could have some higher highlights here where it would be watery and give us that third point. And also because of the blue, it makes a really stark color contrast with the red clay, which brings a lot of attention to the paw print, which, or the track, which is good. That's good. Yeah, I like that a lot. And now the bracelet no longer stands out. You don't get drawn to that feather right. thing. Yeah. I also like that it brought more contrast to the footprint. It, like, obviously that's intentional. It's a focal point for the model, which is actually in the base. You want the viewer to look at it. You don't want it to be a little thing they discover. You want it to be kind of in your face a little bit. And this accomplishes that. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, you asked me a question, and I got caught up trying to explain that's that okay. blue thing. But um, I was. I was talking about the triangles, right? How you 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 want odd numbers, which you talked about a little bit. Your eye will naturally look for a third thing. And so uh, you want to place those three things where when your eye goes looking for it, it finds it in a place that you want the eye to find it, right? Your eye is looking right. for an odd number. So you land on the face. It's got these white dots. You see more white in the arm. And your brain is going to go looking to find more of them. And yeah. then you find it in the footprint. Eddie translated his stuff to English. He said, they're making a mirage. Got it. <laughs> yes, a mirage. Yeah. So essentially it acts like a, a frame without actually going all the way on the outside of the composition, but it acts as a frame in the sense that you're going to use those corners as boundaries for where your eye should go. So if you cluster all three or four of those corners in the top half of the model, then it's very, very hard to force for the viewer to force their eyes to look down at the other parts. Right. It's just not, not intuitive. It's not natural to do. Um, so we want to make it easy and natural to look at the whole model because we put effort into the whole model, right? Right. Um, and so we, we strategically place uh, where that third occurrence comes in to help draw the eye. Does that make more sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, Trash says, that's not what he said. Translator is your friend. Uh, we'll try that. Yeah, Google Translator is not helping me. So if you figured uh. it out, Trash, your Google Translator is better than mine. I tried it. I tried it with the first couple, but I got nothing. So I'm just going in here uh, and adding in some darker lining for the boots. Now, this is an important thing to do in general when working on miniatures. I mean, this is a more basic thing, but... You're cutting in and out. Uh, this is... I can only hear like every other word. <laughs> that's okay. Everybody else should be able to hear. For you, I oh, might okay. cut out in and out a little. Uh, gotcha. 
the the importance of overshading on a miniature is critical in order to make light look like it's working properly. Right? Light bends around things. And it reflects off of things, and it does all these different things. But generally speaking, the edge of a shadow is fuzzy. And that's very much proportionate to size. So a ledge that sticks out three feet on the side of your house is going to cast a shadow when the sun is overhead. If it only sticks out a quarter of an inch, there will be a little bit of a shadow underneath it but it will not be nearly as pronounced, and it certainly won't go all the way to the ground. So on a miniature, when you want it to look bigger, you have to paint those shadows in, and you have to paint them in way darker than natural lighting would convey them in order to convey a sense of scale, because you want it to look like a person that's far enough away that you can see them at that size. Did I cover that properly? Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah very good. So I'm bringing in some of that red tone into this armband because I'm noticing that we have that color appearing in both of the boots, mm. but nowhere in the upper half of the model from the main viewing angle. So I'm bringing that in here. I think the top of her right boot also doesn't quite match the bottom part of the right boot. So it's not reading as cohesive to me. Okay. Now that could again be to ZBrush shadows. Right? Could be. Could be. better mm. yeah I think so closer so with this model we're now at a point where it's looking really good right it is still lacking your characteristic super color which is not normal, it's not what most people do. It's not typical painting. But when you paint something, everything seems to have more saturated color, for lack of a better term. It's not really saturation. I don't know how to describe it. How do you bring that out? If this was a watercolor, what would you be doing to really amp that up? What would be different? Um, well, I mean, I think the thing about watercolor is that a little of that is aided by the lack of choice. Okay. You have saturated colors, um, so you use saturated colors, and it's a lot more difficult to mix grays with watercolor without it just looking muddy and gross. So you end up using colors instead of grays for your shadows. Yeah. I mean, like here, we could bring in some of that turquoise if we wanted to in the shadow. Just make that thing a little more. Do you see what that does? Uh-huh. I do. Bryce says, looking so good. Thanks, Bryce. I think when we do the next one, because we're going to try to do one of these color studies a month or so, uh, we should do one where you deprive yourself of the portions of the palette that you would not have 
if you were doing a watercolor. I don't know that that's possible. <laughs> then just paint it exclusively with colors you would be able to achieve with watercolor. I think that could be a fun study. Bryce says, you can't use green. <laughs> well, I'm called chair. I have lots of greens in watercolor but most of them I have like a lime green and then olive green and then like a jungle green and then a kelly green which is more bluish green <laughs> and then like a phthalo green just a straight up turquoise <laughs> we could do a stream where you actually do watercolor too that could be fun Oof. <laughs> it's been a minute for you is that a little intimidating very, yeah. I think it's been two or three years since I painted anything with watercolor. Oh, it has not been that long. You are physically incapable of going more than nine months without getting out your watercolors. You would die. Yeah, I think you'd be surprised. Time flies. It does fly. Bryce would like you to do a watercolor, too. Maybe we'll do a special Sunday stream. Stop agreeing with him. Bryce knows. He gets it. Overall, I'm really happy with this. Is there anything left that you feel needs tweaking? And if so, why? If you're talking, right I can you. I said this was really nice. This little <laughs> darker gray right here. Oh, yeah. Really pops. Yeah, it's a good color. When my lipstick pops. Now, out of minor curiosity, because we're in ZBrush, what happens if you turn on BPR real quick here? Which you should save it before you do that. But <laughs> before ZBrush just has a freaking heart attack. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so get a good angle here. Bryce wants you to now paint this color scheme on Zariah. Or maybe he didn't mean that. He just says, I want you to do this on a mini now. So he might have just meant this level of awesomeness on a miniature. Yeah, I know, Bryce. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. The problem is, uh, I went and picked up a paintbrush the other day to work on a mini. And then I was like, why does this not do anything I want it to do? <laughs> and I think mostly it's because I was trying to paint with acrylics, and acrylics are the worst material. <laughs> they, do, they are not intuitive to me in any way. And it's like dry before I can even touch the model. It's the most frustrating painting experience I've ever had <laughs> so next time I go to break out a mini I'm gonna get my oils and actually have fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah Bryce said use oils then you can yeah. always come back and do the touch-ups and the highlights with acrylic like uh, Wapple used to do he doesn't do it anymore he can get all the effects he wants with just oil but both of them are easier to use for specific things. And you can go back and forth a little. Yeah, that's fair. And I might. It's a good point. He, he's quoting Wapple at you. Thin on thick and thick on thin. Yeah. Anyway, that is, that is our color study for today of this beautiful tiger uh, and our fierce Zariah. Um, and I will post final pictures on our Discord and all of our socials and stuff. Um, I was posting a sample palette uh, 
with some of our with some of my color studies from earlier this month and people said that that was useful I think now that maybe for those of you who have followed along with a decent part of this process I think you can see how silly it kind of is for someone to say can you put can you list the swatches that you used for this mini and I'm like well <laughs> that would be like dozens and dozens and dozens of colors um yeah that's that's not feasible that's not a thing i can do i can't just like list all of the colors that i use for this it's approaching uh, like triple digits right yeah but i can give you sort of like a basic these are the general hues that i was working with mainly um and then they sort of will just have to find some of those magic colors themselves <laughs> well and i think it's also true that although, yes, you can't spell out every color that you put on this model. For someone like me, whose painting skill is miles below yours, uh, the swatch palettes that you put together are infinitely useful because I'm still at the level where I just pick stupid colors. <laughs> right? I'm, I've got this nice orange shirt, and then I put this brown jacket on, and then I put this blue neckerchief and you're like why why that blue that's the wrong no no there there are no wrong colors but that's a wrong color <laughs> <laughs> and it prevents me from making that mistake and i can have a very satisfying painting experience by using your color guides even though i'm a color idiot so there's value in it just not for better painters I say better. I mean, there's not value in it for people that have been doing this for 10 years. You know, if you're Bryce, the color palette's largely useful. You see those useless. You see those by glancing at it. But if you're me, well, that's a different story. So. Well, and I think I think you just realized how how limiting it would be, which is something that you've run into using my color palettes, where you're like, I don't know how you got this color. In the render using the colors you listed on here. And I'm like, oh, well, you would just mix this with this one or this with that one. And you're like, I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't know to mix those things. And I'm like, Somewhat. As long as you're giving me the... You did one where you put the colors just as a list. These are the whites, these are the greens, these are the blues. And I was like, that's that was not helpful. <laughs> the ones where you break it down, this is for the clothing, this is for the skin, this is for the hat. That's amazingly useful. Uh, Chromatic Miniature says, I see these color studies of yours and they super make me want to copy them onto the actual mini. I feel like I learn a lot. They're beautiful and I love seeing them. Uh, Thank you. I'm learning a lot by doing exactly what he just said because your color guides are basically that. You're poly painting it or painting it and taking a picture depending on the model and then you're giving me colors to start with. And yeah, every time I do it, I'm learning more. Let's uh, let's find somebody to raid. Let's see what we got. Yes. Look around here a little. Mm. See who we can find. If you feel like painting to the riot, or you have a totally different color palette that you think would be cool. Um, Go pick up a copy and and paint it and show me and tag me. I want to see. I want to see what you do. Oops. Sometimes I like I make a mini and I have such a such a strong idea color wise of what it will look like mm -hmm. that when when other people paint it differently, I'm like, whoa! I never would have thought of that. <laughs> because it was just like never in my brain because it was always that color in my brain since I started sculpting it. Right. Well, that's been your concern the whole time with the color guides. Right. I didn't want it to feel limiting or feel like, you know, you couldn't experiment with other color schemes. I actually, even when I was putting, when I was thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing Zariah for the stream and I need to pick out uh, a reference picture and I found another picture of this one actually had two tigers in it. Um, but the scheme was more purples. 
It was sort of like a smoky, hazy purple, like an amethyst mm-hmm. with with the tiger colors. And it had a softness to it that I found really appealing. And I was like, I could I could do her in these colors. I could do the purples and sort of these like hazy colors and that would work on the hair and I could definitely use that for the bone. And like I had all these ways of, that I could apply that. But then I was like, well, but that really isn't like true to the initial vision that I had. And I really wanted to see if I could compare where I was when I first made her versus what I'm capable of doing now. Um, as more of a direct comparison, but yeah. it, you definitely could have taken it any number of other ways. All right, I found someone to us for us to raid JW Miniatures. Okay. So I'm gonna hit the button, and we're gonna go make food. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Um, we will see you on Friday, same time, one two, whenever. <laughs> yes. Please stick around for the raid. It's helpful for us. It's helpful for JW Miniatures. It's appreciated. If you got to go, yeah. totally get that too. But thank you for joining us, and we hope you all had a fantastic time and enjoy your weekend. Week. Week. Back with more sculpting on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> See you soon, guys.